Good afternoon, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear students. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here on behalf of Buceris Law School and its Center for International Dispute Resolution to the Buceris HIAT conference. We organized that conference jointly with our friends from CAMCCBC in Brazil, the Hamburg Arbitration Circle and the Rechtsstandort Hamburg, usually shortly before the uh, CAMCCBC Hansa Premude. It's a great pleasure that so many of you made it despite the major strike we organized in Germany for you yesterday and which also had some, still caused some problems today. This year's topic will be the perennial topic of arbitration with state parties. And normally you could have an entire week on the various issues resulting from that. So we had to focus on very few topics, but I'm sure that there will be opportunities to discuss other topics later during break or during the Q&A session. Our first session will be devoted to jurisdictional problems. And we have views from Latin America plus views from Europe. And I'm told that our Latin American friend will present her views in German. No, she's fluent in German. She will speak naturally English. So no worries. Uh, but we are very pleased to have someone from Brazil here who is absolutely fluent in German. The second sec session will then be devoted to both merits issues as well as enforcement issues. And that will be followed then by what we call the Bismuth Lecture, which addresses usually one of the arbitration problems arising in the VIS case. And for us, we made it very difficult for the speaker to come. He hasn't landed yet. Yeah, he was supposed to come yesterday. But we have someone at the, at the airport, and we had some other speakers who volunteered to take up his time, if need be where they were cut short this morning when they asked me whether they should speak for an hour, an hour and a half. I told them 30 minutes is sufficient. Let me also take the opportunity to make a little bit of shameless self-marketing. First, for the Master of Law and Business program at Butzerius Law School. We have an excellent program here at Butzerius, which is based on the life cycle of a company looking both at the um, business side as well as the legal side. So the students in the room, if you want some information about that, there will be people from the master program downstairs, and they are also happy to arrange during the time you're here in Hamburg any individual or answer individual questions you have. There's also a number of scholarships, um, part-time scholar, part scholarships, uh, which are available, and it's taught in English. And the second shameless self-marketing is for the Cambridge Compendium of International Commercial and Investment Arbitration. You will find, the, which has just come out, and you will find some copies downstairs. Um, and I apologize because it looks very shameless. Uh, the promotion flyer or the promotion code was not my idea. I only saw it yesterday for the first time. I apologize for that one. But with that, I turn over to my colleague and friend, Luisa Kermel from CAMCCBC to welcome you on behalf of CAMCCBC. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all again. Uh, it is my greatest pleasure to be here today on behalf of the CAMSA CBC, which is the Center for Arbitration and Mediation of the Chamber of Commerce Brazil-Canada. And some of you do ask me quite often, why Brazil? And why Brazil-Germany? Why Brazil-Canada? We will get to that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we are, at the CAMSA CBC, we are the leading arbitration institution in Brazil. And we usually rank among top eight of the arbitration institutions worldwide. So uh, first, I would like to thank the Busirios Law School for the longstanding partnership and for organizing this incredible event. Uh, special thanks to Professor Stefan Crow and to Tilo, which I don't see at the moment, but yeah, he makes it happen. <laughs> um, 
as an arbitral institution, one of our main goals is to promote professional and academic studies and initiatives related to alternative dispute resolution, which is the case for arbitration and mediation. Uh, the importance of the topic for us is the following, so the, both the Vismut case and, of course, the, the topic for today's lecture. Uh, last year alone, we had 10 new arbitration cases involving Brazilian state and state-owned parties. There were around 10% of ongoing arbitration proceedings involving those kinds of parties. So um, it does show a sign of growth in, in this type of dispute, both in Brazil and internationally. You will certainly hear more about this from uh, Cristina Masrobono, which might or might not be speaking in German, uh, and also from Mr. Ricardo Pregliano, one of our vice presidents. Um, I cannot... Uh, leave without thanking Elka Umbeck. Uh, she organizes the Hamburg Premier with me and also thanks to all of the firms for their invaluable cooperation. Without them, we would not be here. And um, just before we, we end, I would like to answer the, the why Germany, why Brazil and Germany. And besides being a very important commercial partner, uh, Brazil and Germany, there is also a um, representative portion of our arbitration cases which are regarding European parties. And so both the Netherlands and Portugal and of course Germany. So that's why we're here today. Uh, also, thank you to the panelists for, for making this event possible. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be amongst your presence. And of course, thank the students, arbitrators, and lawyers who are here today. Hope you can absorb as much as possible of the knowledge and hope you can have fun tomorrow at the Hamburg Premier. Uh, last but not least, usually uh, Stefan used to gift the speakers with um, something from Sirius Law School, and we never had the opportunity to give him back something. So for this year, we would just like to put behind all of the uh, rivalry between Brazil and Germany, and because both countries did such poorly <laughs> on the last World Cup, uh, can you please come here? I we would like to give you something on behalf of Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. That'd be all. So, thank you very much, Luisa, for that very kind present. Um, I remember when the Kamsi CBC rules were on. Uh, those of you who were present at the time will have realized that it was all about football. Yeah? So all the names were former football players yeah? uh, mixed up a little bit. And at the time, your president was also an ardent football supporter. And for me, as a football fan, and uh, would have been if there had been sufficient talent football professional, yeah? uh, I enjoyed the time in Brazil watching several games uh, at the legendary stadiums. But coming back now to our event today, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to, to you, Christina Wagner Masrubueno. She is a Brazilian-German lawyer acting as an independent arbitrator in disputes arising from complex contracts, including those under concessions and PPP models. She served the legal department of the state of Sao Paulo, where she developed a large experience in public business law, including all forms of interaction between the public and private sectors, such as structuring concession projects, privatization or assignment of receivables and corporate law aspects of state enterprises and state-owned companies. So there's probably no one more suitable to give an insight into our today's topic, jurisdictional issues. She holds a GD from the Universidad de Sao Paulo and holds an LLM degree from the University of Chicago. Christina is a fellow from the Chartered Institute of Arbitrator and its vice chair of the Brazilian branch. Christina, we're looking forward to your presentation and the floor is yours.
Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Professor Kroll set up a very high standard for me to speak here, so I'm getting a little bit nervous. So, um, well, first of all, I want to thank Professor Kroll and Luisa for inviting me to be here today. It's really a big pleasure and a great honor to be speaking in Germany. As Professor uh, said, my family comes from Germany and we managed to keep the traditions and the language in Brazil. That's why I speak German. And saying, uh, speaking about speaking in German, I was really happy at the beginning when the invitation came that I would be able to come and speak in German and show off how I can. <laughs> but then I started to prepare myself and uh, I was told, no, it's in English. And I, I got frustrated, but so I, I started to, to prepare the presentation. And then suddenly I realized that instead of saying arbitration, I would have to keep saying Schiedsgerichtsbarkeit. And instead of telling about the Supreme Court decisions, I would have to say Bundesverfassungsgerichtsentscheidung. So <laughs> I thought it was a good decision. Let's just keep it in English and go on. Well, um, as Professor also told, I had this experience in working for the government of the state of Sao Paulo. And I was there when uh, the state started to use the arbitration agreement in its contracts uh, more or less 10 years ago. Uh, it, was already using, I, as I will uh, explain to you, but uh, really the state started to use 10 years ago. And I had the opportunity to discuss the, um, um, the wording of the arbitration agreement and to follow up all the problems that we were facing in the beginning of this journey there. So now I, I am not uh, with the state anymore. And I see now that the first clause was really terrible. And <laughs> thank God we could improve it in uh, the passing of the years. But, well, I will address uh, my speech. I will address three topics. Uh, I will give you a little uh, a panorama about arbitration with the public sector in Brazil. Uh, I will tell about the phases of the jurisdictional problems that uh, were faced. Uh, that I call denial, the first one, like there is no problem, we do not use arbitration. The second phase is it's not your problem, meaning it's not the problem of the uh, arbitral tribunal. And the third one is it's not my problem, meaning uh, me as a entity, a, a public entity, I'm not taking part in this arbitration, I don't recognize your jurisdiction. And I will finish with some, giving you some perspectives of the issue in Brazil. So first, uh, arbitration with public entities is uh, already a reality in Brazil. So Brazil signed a lot of BITs, bilateral investment treaties, but never ratified them. Uh, but what happened is that uh, public entities are also under the Federal Arbitration Act as if they were private parties. Uh, and what is important to know in Brazil that the development of arbitration with public entities, it really started with the development of projects uh, related to infrastructure. And um, so I give you some facts here that Brazil is a uh, country with a very big gap in infrastructure. And this kind of uh, problem uh, was, so the best solution for these problems of infrastructure problems in Brazil is to use uh, the private sector and to use the contracts in the model of concessions and public-private partnerships where do you not use public fundings but the um, fundings from the private sector. And this kind of contract, these are usually long-term contracts, uh, very complex with a lot of objects involved and with sophisticated parties. 
And this kind of contract really demands the use of the arbitration agreement. And since in Brazil, these projects have to be subject to a tender offer, the way to improve competition was also using the arbitration agreement. So uh, that's why we can really say that the development of arbitration with public entities in Brazil is directly related to development of infrastructure. And that's why the state of Sao Paulo is the state that has more uh, the biggest knowledge about this theme because it's the federated uh, state that is the most developed in, in Brazil and therefore the uh, use of arbitration was mainly uh, introduced in this uh, federated state. So uh, considering arbitration, we can say that in Brazil there is a really strong framework to use arbitration with public entities. Well, our Feder uh, Federal Arbitration Act, is the law 9307, is from 96. And the first problem that uh, arose relating to public entities is that this um, legislation did not have a direct um, authorization for public entities to use the arbitration. So it was a gap, and this gap was understood for scholars, for uh, professionals related to administrative law. This gap was uh, interpreted as a non-authorization. And therefore, until 2015, when this uh, federal act was amended, with the introduction of an express rule for public entities. So until then, we have a lot of, uh, as you see, we have a lot of um, jurisdictional problems exactly related to, to this lack of express authorization. But I have to say, uh, the, the legislation that is related to concession contracts and PPPs which are exactly the ones that use the arbitration agreement, they already had this authorization since, uh, uh, 19, since 25 and 20, 24. And also there are some uh, legislation related to uh, federal agencies that have the provision also, uh, already since 97. This is the case from the oil and gas. Uh, sector. That's why we have uh, companies like Petrobras, which is a public entity, but it is already using arbitration uh, for a long time now. And there's another possibility of use of, uh, of the use of arbitration by public entities, which is uh, those contracts that are uh, funded by uh, international investment institutions like the World Bank and IFC or any other uh, multilateral financial entity. entity it's possible by uh, Brazilian administrative law this, that these contracts use arbitration agreement ev even before uh, 2015, even before any other uh, legal authorization. And these were actually the first arbitrations that started in Brazil uh, relay in relation with public entities, where exactly these contracts uh, financed by the World Bank and involving state-owned companies, not the direct administration. So let's say the Federal Arbitration Act was amended. I will just give you uh, an overview about that. Uh, uh, it's uh, here, par paragraph one. Uh, it allows direct and indirect public administration may use arbitration to resolve conflicts regarding transferable public property rights. See, this is the point transferable public property rights. Now, what, what is it? And this is one of the issues that mostly arise in uh, arbitrations and that are taken later to state courts to discuss whether the issue at stake, the issue in dispute, is within this concept. And another, uh, another um, um, condition is that 
here, it comes here in, in Article 2, Paragraph 3. Arbitration that involves public administration will always be at law, uh, opposing to equity, and will be subject to the principle of publicity. So no confidentiality to arbitrations related to public administration. This is the rule. So we could discuss here also for hours, what does it mean, this publicity, who is in charge of it, but uh, we will not enter in this uh, now, today. So another uh, article I want, to, I want to draw attention is the Article 32 that uh, regulates when uh, an arbitral award uh, may be subject to annulment, because these are the cases that are uh, applied to private party and also to uh, public entities. And this actually should be observed whenever uh, an annulment is seeked before, is sought before uh, a judicial court. And there's nothing um, special here related to public entities. So there's no special rule if you consider this article whether um, a condition was not observed or a, a principle was not observed, that an award uh, issued uh, related to a public entity may be taken to discussion to the um, to a state court. So when we talk about jurisdictional issues, um, and here just on parentheses, I will only speak about jurisdictional issues in Brazil because, you know, I would not have time to address also other countries. But uh, I, I uh, uh, um, time ago, I did a very thoroughly uh, research in the decisions of the superior courts in Brazil, which are the Federal Supreme Court and the Superior Court of Justice. And I found 13 decisions in relation to arbitration with public entities that were issued by the, the entire group of the, of the courts. Uh, so these are the ones that we have to look at because they have the, um, the consequence of spreading its effects to the other uh, cases. Decisions actually, they, they started in 2005 mostly and mostly involving state-owned entities and not the um, direct administration. And these are the phases which I referred uh, to in the beginning. I will address each one of them, but uh, what is important to know is they are not chronological uh, phases. Um, mostly, one case is related to more than one argument. There is really a mix of everything that can be uh, analyzed. But the main arguments that are taken to the courts and mainly by the public entity is first uh, not observance of the, a concept that is called in Brazil the strict legality. So uh, why is that? So public administration in Brazil is under a number, a great number of constitutional principles. So the administration has to follow those principles. One of them, uh, there are principles like uh, morality, so public acts have to be not only legal but also moral, uh, the efficiency principle, and there is one, is one of the most antique uh, principles in Brazil, is the legality principle, meaning that all the acts that administration uh, wants to undertake, they have to be authorized in a piece of legislation. And okay, there's also a big discussion. What is here legislation? If it has to be in the constitution, now, in the constitution it, it, if it has to be in a federal act or, but let's say uh, legality. Uh, another argument that is brought is that, um, is the public interest. It's like in our Vismuth case, yes. Um, and a private tribunal should not be um, is not really prepared, so this is the argument that is used. A private tribunal is not capable or able to decide upon public matters because this is something 
uh, in the big interest of all the population, so only state courts would be able to analyze it. And another argument that is brought is just that uh, public policy should not be reviewed by a private tribunal. So uh, private tribunal should not intervene in decisions that were taken by public authorities that were elected uh, to do that, to exercise its powers. And this is straight related to the non-transferable property rights. Uh, but here also, this is an argument that can be exposed before the state courts also, because state courts should also not be entitled to review an ad administrative decision that has, for instance, regulatory powers in it or that is related to public policy. So this discussion here, although it is taken to the to the um, state courts dis, uh, discuss, discussing the, um, in relation to the non-capability of the arbitral tribunal to discuss about public policy, it could just be argued also before the state courts, as it is, as it was for many, many years. Uh, so uh, how do much, how much time do I have? I'm not controlling the time. Okay, I'm going. Okay, because okay. Now I just want to bring to you some of the cases that were um, really leading cases in in Brazil. Um, the first one is the Laje case. So everyone that wants to study jurisdictional issues in Brazil in relation to public entities starts with this case. It's from uh, 1973. It's uh, so before the Federal Arbitration Act was uh, enacted. And it was uh, really, um, there was no legislation at that time, express or non-express, uh, related to arbitration. Also not in relation to, to private parties. And the case was um, the discussion of an amount due to the expropriation of private property during the war. After the war passed, uh, uh, inheritance wanted the, the, um, to receive the, the amount, the value, and there was uh, there was an ar arbitration. The arbitration finished, and when the public sector uh, wanted to get the budget in order to pay for the amount, it was condemned. Um, then the problem came: uh, the uh, prosecution. Uh, um, came with the argument that how did you go into arbitration? It's not possible. There is no uh, express authorization for that. And then the case went straight to the to the federal Supreme Court, and there was a very very important decision uh, where the minister said that the decision about the use of arbitration is within the contractual autonomy of the state. So this was important because um, it really showed that if you are in a contract, a relation between two parties, the state may also use its autonomy in order to decide a lot of things. So including the use of arbitration. So the next important case uh, came uh, with the, we call it the NUCLEP case. It was uh, a contract involving the exploration of a public good, a port terminal. And well, there was a decision to terminate the contract, an administrative decision, and the private party uh, invoked the arbitration agreement and wanted to discuss the, the amount it had to, to receive for determination in a discussion with an uh, arbitral tribunal. And the case went to the courts, to the federal, to the um, superior court of justice. And the decision was that a port, even if it's considered a uh, um, public property, uh, what was at stake there was not if the property was public or not really something in the interest of the 
public in general. What was in discussion was a commercial relationship and the consequences of the, the financial consequences of the termination of that contract. So um, it was clear that even without um, express authorization to arbitrate, the state, in, in this case, it was also a state-owned company, it was possible for the state-owned company to uh, use the arbitration. So uh, this was, decision was very important because it changed the argument that, you know, public interest is everything and that uh, transferable property rights has this very strict concept. Yes, and uh, the minister in this case, he did, did this uh, separation between what is public interest, that there is the public interest in general when the, uh, when the state offic official decides something that has a financial consequence to um, the entire population or to a, a sector or to uh, meaning many people, or if it's a decision within a contract. And in this case, when the state is within a contract, it's working in its own interest and not in the public interest in general. So this is a case that was repeated in many, many others. So, and then this is, this is the phase, it's not your problem, meaning there is a problem, but it's not the problem of the arbitral tribunal and because of lack of jurisdiction. And this is a very, very important case also in Brazil, the Parque das Baleias case. It was, um, this, it involved Petrobras and ANP, which is the agency, for, the national agency for oil. And the agency after uh, Petrobras had a concession and after, I guess, 16 years, the agency decided to change the limits of the field that was explored by Petrobras. And by doing so, uh, Petrobras had to make more investments and had to pay for some additional taxes in the amount of $440 million. So of course, Petrobras, uh, didn't want to accept those uh, changes in the field it was exploring and uh, wanted to uh, start arbitration because the arbitration clause was uh, already within the contract. So uh, the case came to, uh, to many levels of, of the state court and the arguments from the agency were uh, the lack of juris jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal due to the subject matter. Uh, it understood that what was at stake, the regulatory powers of the agency, were considered non-available property rights. Yes, this was within the competence, the autonomy of the regu regulatory agency. Um, other argument was, well, the other thing that was uh, subject uh, to the Superior Court of Justice was the conflict of jurisdiction uh, between ICC and the federal court. And another argument, also very interesting in this case, was the participation of a non-signatory third party, which was the Federated State of Espiritu Santo, which were, was directly affected by the change of the regulation. Uh, meaning in a positive way because the state would collect a lot of more taxes. So uh, a, a mix of a lot of arguments, very interesting ones. For me, the most interesting is our regu uh, the regulatory powers subject to the tribunal or only the financial consequences because there's a big difference in it, yes. And well, the um, Superior Court of Justice um, issued a very important also decision because it applied the competence, competence principle and sent it back to the arbitral tribunal. And I was very curious about what would the tribunal decide, 
but then the parties uh, settled um, and they terminated the arbitration. ANP offered special payment conditions and extended for 27 more years the concession. So really a recognition that it had something to pay off in exchange of the modification of the contract. Well, then we have uh, another important case, which is already uh, still going on. Uh, it's also involving Petrobras and uh, minority shareholders. It's a discussion about um, the uh, involving corporate law and the consequences of um, not really fraudulent uh, execution, but um, mis- um, misconduct of the company more or less 10 years ago when the allegations of corruption were going on and the uh, operation car wash that affected directly Petrobras. And the minority shareholders, they uh, started arbitration, a lot of arbitrations, uh, and they uh, were suing also the federal government uh, with the argument that the federal government was also responsible due to uh, the people they uh, chose to compose the administration of the company and lack of supervision of the acts that were uh, practiced in the company. And here, um, what happened was that a Superior Court of Justice a few months or a year later of the other decision I, I told you, where they applied the competence competence principle, here they decided not to use this principle and decide that uh, the federal government should not be part of the arbitration. They uh, introduced another, another concept that um, when there's a prima facie proof of an existence, invalidity, or ineffectiveness of the arbitration agreement, then they can decide and not rely the decision to the arbitral tribunal. So, um, what, but what was also important here to emphasize is that uh, despite emphasizing the possibility of the adoption of arbitration by the government, uh, the possibility does not authorize the extension of the effects of the arbitration clause to the federal government as controlling shareholder. And it's not possible to reach this as an unbound third party. So the, the argument was justified by two main reasons. The impossibility of extracting this authorization from the statutory clause, which would not reach the acts challenged by the minority and the absence of an authorizing rule to extend arbitration proceeding to the controlling partner, mainly because it's a federative entity. So this decision was criticized by a lot of people saying this was only because it uh, was the federal government. But actually, if you see what the liability of the controlling shareholder in corporate law, I think it would be the same decision if it's a private controlling partner, uh, um, a, a private sh shareholder. So it's not very different from what was expected. The only difference really was uh, the not appliance of the competence competence principle. So this is the last one I will uh, tell you. It's a Sanepar case. And the interesting point here is also it's related to our Vsmod problem. Um, there was a, a sharehold uh, agreement in discussion between one private party and a state-owned entity, a state-owned company uh, that provides water in a state of Paraná. And it went to arbitration, but the problem was there was an allegation of corruption in the, <clears throat> in the contract, in the process, and the state court decided that due to this corruption allegation, uh, the, tribunal, the arbitral tribunal was not competent to analyze the case and send it to the state court because also it involved the state attorney's office and state attorney office would not act in the arbitration. So if we analyze these three uh, decisions that I brought to you, we see that 
uh, most of the cases, 53% uh, of the cases in the superior courts in Brazil decided about the uh, uh, arbitrability uh, concerning the subject matter that is at stake. And, uh, 30, and 15 uh, decided considering the condition of the party, meaning because it's a state-owned party or because it's the public administration directly, um, whether it could or not um, be subject to arbitration. And 30% discussed all the issues um, together. So now about perspectives, what, where, what can we say? Uh, I think that the faces that jurisdiction analyzed, the cases that jurisdiction analyzed until now are just the peak of the iceberg, unfortunately. I think this kind of discussion that was until now, the, the first phase uh, mostly, whether they can be subject to arbitration or not, this is past, this is history, because there is already this legal understanding that state uh, entities may enter in arbitration. The biggest problem is state entities or the state does not leave the condition of being a state when it goes into arbitration, which is a very uh, private way of uh, resolving disputes. And arbitrators have to have that in mind. Uh, Therefore, I think that as, as so as the arbitration is developing, we will face a lot of cases like the one I cited about Parque das Baleas, where what is at stake is the regulatory power. And if the arbitral tribunal does not make this difference between the powers, uh, the regulatory powers and the financial or economic consequences of that, we may enter and we may have decisions that I am very much sure that will be challenged by the, uh, by the public advocacy in Brazil. And um, also the concept of strict legality. So what does, that means that the tribunal, when they decide, they have to consider all the legislation that applies to public entities or to, to the state. And this is a, a lot of uh, legislation that applies to them, a lot of restriction, a lot of constitutional principles. And although the Article 32 that I showed to you that are the conditions to enter with an annulment of a tribunal award, although there's no direct relation to this uh, um, public uh, legislation, I am sure that as soon as an important legislation will not be observed, I'm sure that it will also be challenged, although it's not in the conditions to uh, propose a challenge before the state courts. But I, I think these are, unfortunately, because I, I think once uh, public entities enter into arbitration, it had both parties have to comply, but we see now in Brazil with um, a lot of uh, annulments that are searched by private party parties also, and I think that public entities will engage in this search for annulment of contracts using all the arguments, all the flexibility and in legal interpretation they may find. So, um, I think this is all. I'm happy to answer your questions. And thank you very, very much again, Professor Kroll. Thank you, Christina, for that very comprehensive overview over the Brazilian problems. Um, just for the Moody's in the room, it's not the Brazilian case I had in mind when I wrote the moot court case. So I don't want to have any LinkedIn saying, Kroll said uh, it's not arbitrable or whatever. Uh, it's not the Brazilian case. After we had the view from Brazil, now we have the European view uh, presented by Markus Burianski, who is the head of White and Case German arbitration practice. 
and his work focuses on national and international dispute resolution. Markus presents German uh, clients and international clients in a variety of arbitration and court proceedings, including those conducted under the ICC, DIS, UNCITRAL, SIAC, ICDR, ICSID, VIAC, Swiss, CAMCCB is still missing, but I think that will change. Um, and he also regularly sits as an arbitrator, uh, either sole arbitrator, chair, or party appointed arbitrator. Um, he has a thriving dispute resolution practice, and one of the last moot court cases, he wrote one of the major articles, which was quoted by everyone. Uh, I could not use your presentation this year again, yeah, so there's something different, but I'm pretty happy to have you here and tell us something about the European view on jurisdiction in disputes with state parties. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's a, an honor to speak to such a distinguished audience and to be on a panel with such renowned colleagues. Uh, in the interest of full and frank disclosure, let me share with you that I was the one asking for additional 90 minutes to present my views. I tried to be brief uh, in, in the interest of time and maybe uh, of the three subject matters I have prepared for you, maybe we'll just discuss two and reserve the third one uh, for, for, for questions afterwards. Um, so let me begin my presentation with, by addressing the elephant in the room. Uh, with my topic, it is very difficult to assert that there's any such thing such as a European view on uh, jurisdictional problems with state parties. Um, taking into consideration the decisions of arbitral tribunals seated in Europe um, and involving European parties or decisions made by European courts, I will still try to write up something along the lines of a European view. Um, I have three topics for you, as I, just, as I just said, the extension of the arbitration agreement from state, par from state entities to state parties, corruption, and maybe if the time so permits, the impact of EU law in commercial arbitrations. Obviously, there would be many more topics, uh, but this is just outside of the uh, realm of this presentation. So let me set the scene for our first topic. Um, what we have here is a contract between an investor and a state entity, uh, maybe a trust fund, maybe a body specifically created for the purpose of the contract, an SPV, um, maybe a ministry, amongst others. The contract contains an arbitration agreement as the chosen dispute resolution method, and when the relation between the parties deteriorates, the investor initiates arbitration, not only against the state entity, but also against the state. Why is that relevant? Um, the relevance is linked to uh, the fact that the achievement of justice and the particular powers that a state has over its own entities. In this sense, it is a prerogative of the state to decide about, uh, to dissolve one of its state entities, state bodies, which would render the counterparty in an agreement uh, concluded with a dissolved entity without any possibility to bring claims or potentially receive compensation for contract breaches. I myself have been in a couple of those cases in which uh, the Con uh, the contract was concluded with the ministry of a given state, uh, and thereafter, wh when the dispute arose, it turned out that the ministry obviously didn't have the assets to satisfy any claim, which is why we sued the state in combination with the ministry and other entities. We have to address the applicable law to decide this issue, and since we are thinking of state entities, there could be an instinct by learned lawyers um, to think about the rules of attribution crystallized in the articles on the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts, the RCEVA, nice acronym. Um, these rules contain specific provisions um, for governmental power um, uh, to con uh, regarding the conduct of state organs, entities empowered with governmental authority. Um, but uh, to, to, to cut the long story short here, they don't apply because the idea is that they apply to internationally wrongful acts, whereas here we're dealing with a constellation of whether an arbitration agreement uh, was concluded with, um, in a way that implies that the state would, bound, would be bound in addition to the state entity. So instead, scholars and practitioners have suggested that the application of the same rules um, that would apply to other third parties, so non-state entities, um, with special, special consideration, of course, because um, from an international public law perspective, the state is one entity, whereas uh, from, the, uh, from the private law perspective, the state is not a unity, but maybe a multitude of entities. 
The ministry, for example, usually does not possess separate legal personality, but rather operates as an organ of the state. Uh, this obviously depends on the constitutional law of the country, but this is a, a, a general truism. So we'll see later, this occasionally raises the question whether the intention was to bind only uh, the relevant ministry or also the state, or both, maybe. What is undisputable is that, as Georges Petrokilos eloquently put in a 2010 article, and I quote here, the extension of the effect of an arbitration agreement with a non-signatory party does not mean that it is possible to dispense with the need for consent to arbitration. End of quote. And the Court of Appeal of England and Wales in the Svenska versus Lithuania case stressed that, again a quote, a government is not to be taken to be a party to an agreement or to have submitted to arbitration simply as a result of the fact that it has put forward a state organization to contract with a foreign entity. I think we've, we've seen some of these ideas when we heard about the Brazilian arbitration law. So consent is the key word here. Um, the decisions of the various um, courts I've looked into, or also the arbitral tribunals, uh, offer obviously turn on the facts and differ from one another, but I believe that there are uh, at least two groups of cases that one can distinguish, where the concept of the, of the state has been found to be implied. So a first scenario is where the implicit consent or intent to be bound uh, by the arbitration agreement can be inferred from the role the state has played in the negotiation, participation in the performance, or the termination of the contract. I have a couple of cases for you that are meant to illustrate these principles. So in the Pyramides case, the case involving Egypt, um, the claimant SPP entered into an arbitration agreement with this state-owned hotel management entity in the Ministry of Tourism of Egypt, which has the, ni the nice acronym EGOF. Um, this happened in the context of a joint venture uh, between the parties for the edification of tourist villages. And while the, while the Ministry of Tourism was a party to the first contract, the arbitration agreement was only con uh, contained in a second contract. Um, in 1983, an ICC tribunal considered that intent for the state to be bound could be inferred because in the second contract, there was a ministry seal with the entry approved, agreed, and ratified. And those of you who have, al have already had dealings with the state will find that in contracts concluded with state and entities, there are stamps and, uh, and authorizations all over the place. So the tribunal found here, um, by the ministry signing not, not only approved, but also agreed, which clearly means the undertaking of an obligation of its own, the government also became a contractual party. Yet the following year, the Paris Court of Appeals held a different view. From its perspective, the notation and the ministry seal were only part of the requirement of the approval of the contract by the authority and not an expression of the will to be bound. As a result, it set aside the award and the French Cour de Cassation eventually confirmed that decision. So this case permits two conclusions already. Uh, one is that from a French perspective, um, the ministry represents the state, so it's not different, not a different entity than the state, and a ministerial seal as such does not suffice um, to infer consent. In another case um, involving Libya, the Swiss federal court also refused to extend the arbitration agreement to the Republic of Libya. The dispute arose out of a construction contract entered into by, a Turkish, um, by Turkish companies, their joint venture and an entity created for the performance of an infrastructure project. And you will uh, hear throughout my presentation that Libya and infrastructure projects on natural resources are a recurring theme uh, in, with regard to the question of when to extend um, an arbitration agreement. So a Geneva seated ICC tribunal decided by majority that it did not have jurisdiction over Libya and the decision was later confirmed by the Swiss Federal Court, which considered that, amongst other things, no evidence had, be, had been submitted with regard to the participation of Libya in the performance and negotiation of the contract, nor had the state participated in the organization of the tender as such, uh, which preceded the conclusion of the contract. Now, here's another case. So, by contrast, the other, the other perspective, um, in ICC case 15113 of 2007, a Paris seated tribunal extended the arbitration agreement to state that. Why is that? The dispute concerned the termination of an exploitation contract. Remember, natural resources exploitation involves states often between claimant and a limited li liability company of which state Z was the majority shareholder. This contract was signed and approved by the Ministry of Energy and Mines. Not so different from the first case. 
The ICC Tribunal found that the state had exceeded its role of a mere supervisory authority and had actually behaved as a party to the contract. And to reach that conclusion, it considered, amongst others, that the state had been present during the negotiation uh, and its performance of the contract, the role of the state had in the termination of the contract, so again, an interaction with the performance. Um, so the, the decision about the termination was made by the ministry and not by the um, company itself, and that the company had acted as a subordinate to the ministry. Final case in that context, uh, also affirming the extension of the arbitration agreement is um, the case between Svenska versus Lithuania, in which um, the claimant had entered into a joint venture with a Lithuanian state-owned company for the development of hydrocarbon resources once again. While Lithuania did not sign the contract, the government had approved it, had acknowledged itself to be legally and contractually bound as if the government was a signatory. Um, it's interesting from the procedural history here that the um, ICC tribunal seated in Copenhagen found that Lithuania was a part of the joint venture and a party to the arbitration agreement. Um, the state, Lithuania, did not challenge the decision. But then when it came to enforcement in England, the, um, Lithuania requested the stay of the enforcement order. But the High Court considered uh, that the ICC tribunal had jurisdiction over Lithuania as it stated that it was clear quote, from the evidence that the state was involved with the negotiations with Skvenska from the outset, and it went on, moreover, by signing its acknowledgement that it was legally and contractually bound, and by accepting obligations and rights under several of the clauses and the GVA, the state was clearly a party thereto. The decision was later confirmed by the Court of Appeal. So this is the, the first category of cases in which we see that the state is somehow involved in the negotiation, the tender, the performance or the termination of the contract. In a second group of cases, um, in which it is, it is accepted that an arbitration agreement can be extended from a state entity to, uh, to the state, to the respective state, is when the substantive law rights and obligations in the main agreement also extend to uh, those same non-signatories. So some tribunals have referred to it as a quote, commonality of obligations and interests, end of quote. Uh, and some authors have argued that this requirement would even be sine qua non to extend an arbitration agreement to state party. What is the rationale here? The idea is that the extension of rights and obligations in the main contract permits the conclusion that the third party, here the state, also consents to arbitration. So somewhat uh, a contradiction to the separability principle seems to correspond somewhat the, that the idea of just we've just heard uh, to the idea of public goods under Brazilian law when I understood the explanations correctly. Um, so two cases here to illustrate um, uh, cases in which substantive rights helped the party extend the arbitration agreement. One is CV versus Bulgaria, 2006, where a dispute arose out of a purchase of shares in Bulgaria's national airline in the context of privatization. In the sad contract, the parties had agreed to submit the disputes to arbitration, obviously, and when the dispute was submitted to the ICC, the tribunal decided that Bulgaria was also a proper respondent to the case. It considered that the privatization agency had acted as a mere agent uh, of the state and acted on behalf and with the author authorization of Bulgaria. Is, isn't that odd? I mean, it's the, uh, the uh, entity acts as an agent, but eventually the tribunal finds that the um, arbitration agreement uh, captures both the mere agent and the state, uh, which is, um, as you know, agents are normally not bound unless there are specific circumstances. A second case in the same vein is breeders workers to Turkmenistan, and some of you may know that there's a whole series of breeders cases which were decided differently, interestingly. So here's one of those in which the arbitration agreement was extended. Um, the claimant had entered into a joint venture with Turkmen Nef, the state-owned entity of Turkmenistan, to exploit oil and gas resources. Again, the ICC tribunal found that Turkmenistan was bound because the obligations referred to could be complied with only by the state, amongst other things, textiles, stabilization clauses, and so on. That is something you find quite often in these concession agreements in the hydrocarbon sector, uh, that the state uses the contract to develop its own economy and creates specific taxes or requests specific taxes or tax cuts 
um, and, uh, and request the investor to train resources of the state in order to, in the long term, be able to run the contracts without the involvement of foreign investors. So in that case, um, we, uh, the, uh, the courts looked in a number of different, di different aspects and uh, the case went back and forth. Eventually, um, it was decided in 2006 that the extension of the arbitration agreement was appropriate since the state had misused the state's entity's corporate form to commit fraud and the veal had to be pierced. So while it may seem that these criteria are somewhat helpful, somewhat clear, um, there is no uniform approach uh, with regard to the question of the, arbit or the extension of the arbitration agreement, which also the Dalla case uh, nicely illustrates. And I think some of you may be familiar with the Dalla case. Um, in that case, which was decided both by English courts and French courts in the same set of facts, the claimant had concluded a contract with an ordinance-created trust. Eventually, the secretary of the trust, which had been dissolved by then already, sent a letter to the claimant on ministry stationery, um, stating that the contract was discharged. Claimant initiated arbitration, and the tribunal decided that the state was a respondent, also a respondent, and awarded damages to claimant. So that was the tribunal's decision. Um, in the context of the enforcement proceedings, so in England, the uh, seat of arbitration was in France, and I'll address this in a moment. So, but the first, the first series of cases started in England in enforcement proceedings. Um, the English courts sided with the state in its objection to jurisdiction. The English Court of Appeal found that, quote, the establishment of the trust and most importantly the execution of an agreement between the trust and Dalla represented a fundamental change in the position. Just as a side note, before the creation of the trust, Dalla had negotiated with the government directly uh, and must have been recognized as such by all parties. Indeed, correspondence which preceded the agreement shows that Dalla was well aware that it would be contracting with the trust as opposed to the government. So end of quote and the... Uh, court also refused to grant any significant weight to the use of ministry stationery, as simply the trust did not possess, possess its own headed stationery. Dallas' appeal was rejected by the English court, Supreme Court, which confirmed that the arbitration agreement did not extend to the state. Now, Pakistan went to the French courts in order to have the award annulled, um, in Paris, and the Paris Court of Appeals rejected the request as it considered that the arbitration agreement had been validly extended to um, the state. It affirmed that both um, before the conclusion of the contract, the state had been the counterpart, and the state had also been involved in the performance of the contract and managed the termination of the contract. So this sufficed from the French perspective to infer consent to extend the arbitration agreement. Now, what do we do with all of that? In my mind, it makes sense for the decision maker confronted with the question whether a state is bound by an arbitration agreement entered into by a state entity to first examine who consented in which role. With that step, in cases where the state entity does not possess an own legal personality, the arbitration agreement was in reality agreed with the state, so the consent expressed by the agent was on behalf of the state. Examples are the cases in which the contract and the arbitration agreement are concluded with, the minis with ministries. As a second step, I propose um, to require consent and to focus on the substantive rights and obligations. Again, in many cases, as we've seen dealing with natural resources, one would conclude that the state did consent because of the state's ownership over these natural resources. The most difficult category is the third one, where the state uses an entity with own legal personality to conclude a contract that does not confer rights and obligations to the state. In these scenarios, I'm wondering whether the indicators I've discussed as in, in the first group are really helpful and whether the state should really, doc the, the, the consent should really be uh, dogmatically be based on the question of um, uh, these indicators suggest consent, whereas other concept of att attribution, for example, piercing the corporate wheel might be more appropriate in these circumstances. So I'll move on to corruption, and the second topic uh, is corruption and what its effect is in commercial arbitration. Let's start by noting that there is no uh, universal one-size-fits-all definition of corruption. 
And even the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, which is a legally binding multilateral treaty with 140 signatories and 189 state parties, does not provide for a definition, surprisingly, to me at least. Um, the French courts in a couple of cases, Alstom, Sorlec, Webcor, have referred to a supposed international consensus, according to which, and you see the quote on the screen, corruption of a, of a public official, whether national or foreign, consists in offering the official directly or indirectly an undue advantage, and it goes on. I think you can read for yourself. I think that's a wonderful, easy to apply definition we all, we as lawyers love. So allegations of corruptions in commercial arbitration are not new. One of the most famous cases is from 1963, um, in which Judge Lagergren, uh, which La Judge Lagergren heard as sole arbitrator, the parties had entered into a commissioning contract. The main factor for the selection of the claimant as commission agent was his close relationship with Argentinian politicians. It was agreed that respondent was to pay a commission for each contract uh, it was awarded as a result of the agent's work. Isn't that nice? It's so, it's so plain corruption, but no, nobody at the, sense, at the time had any sense of, of, of wrongdoing. After a certain time, the respondent refused to pay the commission uh, and claimed started arbitration proceedings. And although the respondent did not challenge the jurisdiction of the arbitrator and instead even confirmed the validity of the arbitration agreement, of the commission agreement, the sole arbitrator, Judge Lagergren, considered that you ought to examine the jurisdictional issue ex officio. And as a result, he declined jurisdiction over the case and stated that it involves, quote, such gross violations of good morals and international public policy, end of quote. He also affirmed that by entering into such a relationship, um, the parties had forfeited any right to ask for assistance of the machinery of justice in settling the dispute. Judge Lagergren's position resembles the one adopted by arbitrators in investment arbitration if the investment treaty contains a legality requirement. As you will know, some, are, uh, some, investment, arbitration, some investment treaties do, others don't. Um, in the Israeli-Uzbekistan BIT, for example, it contains such a legality requirement. And in the Metal Tech versus Uzbekistan case, the Israeli investor had entered a, into a joint venture um, alongside two state-owned companies to carry out the production of molybdenum. Took me a while to pronounce this properly. It's apparently used to harden steel, uh, if Google is correct. Uh, during the proceedings, it was evidenced that Metatech made payments to a government official to exercise his influence in support of the claimant's investment and to another official to use his family relationship with the then prime minister uh, with the same purposes and both payments were obviously breaches of the USPEC criminal code. The tribunal in that investment arbitration case found that corruption is established to an extent sufficient to violate Uzbekistan law. As a consequence, the investment has not been implemented in accordance with the laws of re and regulations of the contracting party in host territory, whose territory the investment is made. So that's, that is what I, that's the language that you find when a BIT contains a legality requirement. As a result, it ruled that it did not have jurisdiction over the matter, somewhat unsurprisingly. However, we're dealing with commercial arbitration here, and the situation is different in commercial arbitration. Judge Lagergren's opinion um, remains controversial because it neglected the doctrine of separability provided for in most national arbitration laws, as you will all, all be familiar with, and it goes back to Article 23, Paragraph 1 of the Answer Trial Model Law 2010, which reads that an arbitration clause that forms part of a contract shall be treated as an agreement independent of the other terms of the contract, and so on and so forth. So arbitral tribunals do not lose jurisdiction simply because one party alleges that the main contract is void or voidable for corruption and any other reason. That is an issue to be addressed at the merit stage. An illustration here is the Fiona Trust case, another English case, where the claimant charterers had concluded eight charter parties with the respondent ship owners. And when the ship owners purported to rescind the contract because of bribery, the charterer launched arbitration proceedings. Um, in response to this, the ship owners applied to restrain the arbitration proceedings because they had rescinded, in their mind, both the um, charter parties and the arbitration agreements. The English House of Lords confirmed that even if the charter party had been procured through bribery, 
uh, that could only be relevant to the main contract and would not invalidate the arbitration clause since there was no evidence that the agreement was obtained through bribery as well. So it is clear then that for an allegation of corruption to become a jurisdictional problem, and that is the topic of uh, our presentation now, in a commercial arbitration case, corruption must taint the arbitration agreement. Scholars agree that since the agreement to arbitrate is uncommonly subject to separate negotiations, it will often, often be extremely difficult to find evidence uh, that it was agreed through corruption. If such evidence, however, was found, obviously the agreement would be considered valid. So what do arbitrators do in these scenarios? What does an arbitrator do when it, is encou uh, when it encounters allegations or indicators of corruption? This is a matter of the merits, and the trend is for arbitrators to investigate suspicions of corruption. For instance, arbitrators in France seated arbitrations are indirectly encouraged to investigate because when French courts review awards, they carry out a de novo analysis and apply a standard if serious, precise, and concordant indications of corruptions exist. An example here is a 2021 case, Paris Court of Appeal, uh, which rejected to set aside a given award because it uh, assessed, the, it assessed the work of the arbitrators and said that it noted that the court, um, that the arbitrators had considered all the evidence submitted for the corruption case and found that it was not convincing um, and it, it held that it was rightly incumbent on the arbitral tribunal to carry out that examination. So from a practical perspective, and I'm, I'm a practitioner, uh, the question whether the tribunal should investigate corruption uh, can arise in different scenarios. If one of the parties raises corruption allegations, there's little doubt that the, arbitrary, that the tribunal must address, address those allegations, as it does with all the rest of that party's arguments. However, the interesting question is, if the evidence submitted by the sad party is insufficient to fully convince the tribunal, should the tribunal be proactive and investigate? Similarly, what is the tribunal to do if there have been no allegations of corruption by either party, but the tribunal itself ex officio encounters uh, red flags or indicators? In these scenarios, the tribunal is confronted with a dilemma. Should it investigate sua sponte, ex officio, or would that amount to activities ultra petita that could render the award unenforceable? I think we've heard about, about Article 32, Roman 4 of the Brazilian Federal Arbitration Act, which also deals with uh, annulment because a uh, tribunal decided ultra petita. Pierre Meyer proposes to bear in mind that the, uh, that the tribunal's jurisdiction derives from the will of the parties and the arbitrators are constrained by the parties' submissions. Pacta sunt wonder, the contract must be performed, nothing more, nothing less. On the other hand, corruption is immoral. As Ickbock was stated, Quote, the illegality or immorality of a contract cannot be cured or condoned either by a failure to plead or by agreeing to waive it in the most solemn manner. One justification of the legit legitimacy of sua sponte investigation would be that arbitrary tribunal, though not organs of the state, administer justice, the judiciary function of arbitrary tribunals. Therefore, they must investigate corruption since it's a part of public responsibility that comes with the administration of justice. Arbitrary decisions are not subject to a revision au fond, as you know, and arbitrators are therefore arguably under an obligation to be diligent. Another justification would be the duty of arbitrators to render an enforceable award. Many arbitral rules, such as the LCIA, for example, set out that the arbitral tribunal shall make every reasonable effort to ensure that any award is legally recognized and enforceable at the arbitral seat. So indeed, the rendition of an award that endorses corruption is arguably contrary to public policy and as such enforceable in accordance with the New York Convention and also as we have seen under Article 32 of the Brazilian Federal Arbitration Act. What is then about that risk that the award may equally be unenforceable because it is granting more than which the parties requested in their prayer for relief? So the ultra petita idea. I think a strict to censor as long as one party requests that the other party's claims be dismissed, it does not matter how the tribunal reaches that result. Jura no novit curia and a sua sponte investigation would be a scenario where the tribunal is relying on legal rules related to the fight against corruption that have not been alleged by the parties. It's the, the law, not the facts. 
And many arbitration rules permit or even oblige the tribunal to investigate the facts, such as Article 28.2 of the DIS rules, which permits the argument that investigating the underlying facts, including corruption, is very much in line with the party's agreement. So in my view, in some arbitral tribunals are entitled to investigate allegations of corruptions if the record provides for sufficient indications. Now, in the interest of time, I will skip about over my next slide, the duty to investigate and the stay or not to stay. Happy to discuss this later on during, um, during the Q&A session. And we'll just briefly look into my third topic, the impact of EU law and commercial arbitration. So what is this about? On 6 March 2018, the European Court of Justice, ECJ, issued its ACMEA decision, where it held, and I'll quote, it's a long quote, sorry about that, but it's important, that Articles 267 and 344 TFEU must be interpreted as precluding a provision in an international agreement concluded between member states, um, such as Article 8 of the BIT at issue, under which an investor from one of those member states may, in the event of a dispute concerning investments in the other member state, bring proceedings against the latter member state before an arbitral tribunal whose jurisdiction that member state has undertaken to accept. So that's the, the heart of the ACMEA decision. And it was, a, as many of you will know, a game changer for intra-EU investment arbitration. But is it of any, relevant for commercial, uh, any relevance for commercial arbitration? So, as you see on this slide here, not long after this discussion, there was a lot of speculation in the arbitration community about how this could spill over to commercial arbitration. So, the, quote, the, the, the headline, Berman Blaze ECJ at Gar Life Istanbul, we need to talk about Achmea again, it's not about investor state um, uh, arbitration, and so on. How far does Achmea really reach? And in order to assess that question, it is helpful to look at, um, uh, to, to analyze uh, the ECJ's decision in the ACMEA case. And the ECG organized its analysis of the dispute resolution, dispute resolution mechanism contained in the Slovakia Netherlands BIT in three questions. First, whether the type of disputes the arbitral tribunal would solve are liable to relate to the interpretation of EU law. The answer in that case was yes, since in accordance with the BIT, the tribunal had to take into account the law of the contracting parties. Now, is it possible that a commercial arbitral tribunal has to deal with questions of EU law? Obviously. Second point, whether the arbitral tribunal is situated within the EU judicial system. And the answer was no, which was one of the reasons why the ECJ thought that um, uh, investment arbitration would not be a suitable mechanism. Now, the same is true for commercial arbitration. The arbitral tribunal is not situated within the EU judicial system. As you know, arbitral tribunals are not entitled uh, to refer cases to the ECJ and so on. So second box checked. The third point was uh, if the arbitral tribunal's decision would be subject to a review by a court of a member state. And the answer in that case was yes. However, the review was limited to what the national law permits, which did not suffice, uh, which, uh, which was not good enough for the ECJ, so to speak. And um, I think the same we, we can find for commercial arbitrations. Yes, they are subject to review, but only a limited review. Now the, uh, at the seat of the arbitration, annulment proceedings and in enforcement scenarios, are, uh, it will be tested against the uh, reasons of the New York Convention. So the core reasoning um, behind the analysis of the ECJ is the primary and direct effect that characterizes EU law. Admittedly, based on these principles, one could argue that the ECJ's logic equally applies to commercial arbitration. Now, should we all go home and specialize in a different area? Um, I mean, if, if you listen to Gaffney, for example, and he says, um, if the issue is the removal from the EU jurisdiction, then the member state already did that with the New York Convention, also the model law, that limits the court's review, as by it, EU member states agree to remove the disputes from the jurisdiction of their own courts. So in short, the ability of a party um, to have a dispute involving any provision of EU law heard in commercial arbitration as such may be a breach of a member state's obligation to ensure the full effectiveness of EU law. That is the, that's the thrust of the, of the discussion here, why some colleagues believe that Achmea is relevant for commercial arbitration. In 2021, the ECJ in the Comstroy case extended that reasoning to the ECT, the Energy Charter Treaty, um, 
and later on, so this is Achmea, uh, later on in the PL Holdings case, the ECJ analyzed the validity of an ad hoc arbitration agreement concluded between the parties when its content is identical to an arbitra the then arbitration clause of a treaty. And that's, that's a nice one here. It's, it, you have to really to, to taste this on, on, on your tongue. So the uh, Poland had entered into in a BIT, which was invalid based on the Achmea reasoning, and then it entered into an ad hoc arbitration agreement, which had the same mechanism, but with the idea in mind that the ad hoc arbitration mechanism uh, would help circumvent, uh, circumvent uh, the logic of the Achmea case. And so um, uh, the ECJ said that to allow a member state which is a party to a dispute which may concern the application of interpretation of EU law to submit that dispute to an arbitral body with the same characteristics as the body referred to in an invalid arbitration clause contained in a BIT by concluding an ad hoc arbitration agreement with the same content at that clause would in fact entail a circumvention of the obligations arising for that member state under the treaties. You wonder what the legal advisor of, of Poland had in mind when they uh, advised to conclude the ad hoc arbitration agreement. Now, will that be the end of um, commercial arbitration in the EU? Um, I don't think so. The last um, 6th of March, as I said, was the fifth anniversary of ACMEA. While the ECJ has not stayed silent since about the compatibility of intra-EU investment arbitration with EU law, its decisions have not yet crossed the line to commercial arbitration. Perhaps the explanation is less of a legal nature and more of a policy and practical considerations. I don't know. I personally find that mere decision, that mere decision wrong, so I find it quite difficult to justify it in relation to commercial arbitration. But in my mind, the Achmea, Comstroy and PL Holdings line of cases permits us, permits the practitioner, permits the courts um, to distinguish between investment and commercial arbitration based on the mere fact that investment arbitration involves, by definition, a state party. Now, pause here. Hmm. Is that possible for commercial arbitration as well? Of course. The really interesting setting for the next preliminary reference to the ECJ uh, would then be a commercial arbitration case involving a state. Maybe if you think back to the first part of my presentation, could be a case in which the state is not even a party to the arbitration agreement, but in which the tribunal confirms its jurisdiction over the state based on the finding that the subject matter is about rights and obligations under the main agreement, which extend to the state. Could be an interesting scenario. Let's find a case, refer this to the ECJ, and hear what the ECJ has to say. Could be one of the German motorway concession agreements, which pretty much meet this requirement, and then we would have another, uh, probably, ACMEA 2 case referred by a German court. Let's see. That's all from me. Thanks very much for your attention. And I'm happy to discuss and hear your questions. Excellent presentation and also for staying large in time. Unfortunately, the break has already started, but you don't need a break, I assume. So the, if there are some questions, we are happy to answer them concerning jurisdiction. There is a question by Julia. Thank you very much for uh, wonderful presentations. I have two questions, one to Christina and one to Marcus. Question to Christina is very short. I'm just curious if uh, Execve Bona is excluded as, as part of applicable law. It is only law which can be applied to arbitration under Brazilian law for parties uh, involving state entities. And probably I will just uh, uh, ask uh, immediately another question to Marcus. In uh, last year, uh, Michael Rizvas uh, published uh, an article on extension of arbitration agreement to state parties in uh, International um, Comparative Law Quarterly, where he argued quite interestingly that it is public international law which shall or must uh, govern uh, the question of extension. So the concept of estopel and some other concepts which um, he referred to. I'm currently uh, finalizing an article in response to that article where I take the position that public international law doesn't govern extension and that it is national law and probably to some aspects of factual. So it's a matter of law and facts. So I wonder whether you, you are with me or whether you support Michael Rizas. Thank you very much.
And I'll try to buy time and uh, ask Christina to ask to answer your first question first. Hi. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think I understood really the the, f the beginning of your question. What do we? Because um, the legality uh, uh, deciding upon legality means the arbitrators are not allowed to use equity, so they have to consider all the legislation that is applied to a given contract, uh, even if the, le if the legislation is not maybe the best uh, or, you know, it uh, gives a negative performance to a party in the interpretation of that law, but uh, arbitrators may not just set it aside and use a sense of justice in uh, in a given case, I don't know if it's clear. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I wish I, I would have seen your article, your draft article, your your response uh, to the publication you just mentioned. I haven't, um, but I think my spontaneous reaction is that the idea of applying public international law to the question of extending the arbitration agreement. Uh, goes in the same vein as the, uh, the, the the school of thought that would apply the ILC principles of wrongful international acts. So the idea to find a, a public instrument um, to um, deal with the question of extension of arbitration agreement. It, it does not persuade me uh, with regard to the uh, Arziva principles. And also I think public international law is not the, not the right perspective uh, to assess the question of whether a privately concluded contract should extend to a third party, even though that third party is a state. Uh, so I, th I think, uh, without having read your draft article, I'm, uh, I seem to be a supporter of the position you would be taking. hope that is helpful. Any further questions? Yes, please. Um, thank you. Just to follow up to that question, I was wondering if uh, the PIL principles would apply to, let's say, the French system, whereby the validity of the arbitration agreement and possibly uh, extension would look at transnational principles, which sometimes the French courts might refer to public international law instruments. And ultimately, given that there are some more jurisdictions that have uh, that are adopting this approach, I think of West Africa, I think of potentially Mauritius, where I come from, and also with regards to the Swiss, uh, Swiss law, which tells you that whatever law applicable validates the contract or allows for this extension shall apply. In this case, do you think public international law could provide for a potential application in such a scenario? Thank you. I think I've understood the last part of the question, but not the first part. We said in that case, what is? Can, can you define again what is the case you're referring to? Um, in case of extension to, let's say, state parties, whether we could use public international law, uh, given that it's, let's say, applicable as part of the domestic law of some states, um, could we consider international law as one of these applicable laws in determining validity or in determining the extension to a third party? I, if I'm not mistaken, Swiss law provides explicitly that whatever law validates an agreement or allows for this extension shall apply or shall govern the clause. And I was wondering if public international law could have, let's say, an influence and could be considered as a law that validates uh, this agreement of sorts. Thank you. I mean, from an, from an abstract perspective, I think that is uh, what you're just suggesting is, to some extent, the uh, a compromise between uh, the position that public international law as such would apply and the idea that um, I think I presented in my presentation that the uh, the law of the arbitration agreement applies because, in, in, if I understood you correctly, you say the law of the arbitration agreement may be public international law, in which case you would it would lead to public international. I, I think. Logically, theoretically, that, that is that is a, a sensible mechanism. It's just I'm personally not familiar with jurisdictions in which the law of the arbitration agreement would lead us back to uh, public international law. There's one further question over there. Thank you very much to both speakers. Uh, I would like to address Marcus with one short question. Maybe I missed that out, but may you clarify why 
I, as a claimant, maybe should try to push the extension to the state in the agreement? Because it seemed to me from your presentation that I actually create by that more um, yeah, obstacles or walls to my claims, especially in the enforcement proceedings, um, when actually I could benefit, for example, issues of state immunity, which wouldn't have been a problem before. So I know it depends. That's the first part of the answer, I guess. But maybe from a practical perspective, it would be very really interesting for me. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm happy happy to address the question. Obviously, it depends. Um, the uh, I agree with you. That it, it, it would facilitate the proceedings if you if you avoided that question. If you focused the proceedings only on the contractual partner, conducted the proceedings, won the award. And, and that's it, no risk of annulment, no risk of enforcement. But the enforcement part is exactly from a practical perspective why it might be interesting. Because um, as I tried to explain in the first part, maybe I, will, maybe I was too, too, too quick on that part, is state have, states have the prerogative to, dis, to dissolve, to, to, to disbanden their state entities, their public bodies. So two scenarios in which this may become relevant is one is the state body doesn't have the assets at all imagine uh, imagine a high claim and a, and a state body without any assets so you win the award um i don't, I don't know is it, it's it's green but, um, should, should need, do i need to press anything just keep it closer to the mouse keep it closer to the mouse okay is that better or uh, sorry um, so if, if this uh, if if the body um, that has entered into into the arbitration agreement doesn't have the assets to satisfy the claim, you win the award, but you can't enforce it, right? So that's one of the problems. The other one is maybe the body had the asset when you started the arbitration, but during the arbitration, the uh, state decides to abandon to disband that body and say Ministry of Mines, and now, now it's in the end, it's the Ministry of Natural Resources or so. So you, you win the award against a no longer existing entity, and again you have the problem that you can't enforce the award. That is why it is interesting um, to, to pull the state into the proceedings, even though it creates procedural issues, but then you have an award against the state. Okay. Okay, the final question over here, and then we are going for the break. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question would be to Christina. Um, so with regard to the arbitrability of disputes, you mentioned this distinction between regulatory powers on the one hand and financial consequences on the other hand. And I was just wondering what does that entail? So does that relate to the distinction between the validity of regulatory powers which should not be challenged by tribunals as opposed to maybe the legality of it or I don't know maybe you could briefly elaborate on that thank you okay I will try to it's a very complex <laughs> discussion but uh, let's I, I will give you the the case I was talking about uh, uh, oil field case yes uh, what I meant was uh, the 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 change of the borders of the extraction field yes that the national agency introduced um the question is could we challenge this this decision because the the um, administrative body the agency it did that it has to justify why it why it is doing that. So it has to be a financial region, region, um, reason. It has to comply with a lot of legality um, conditions. But once the decision is made, uh, can we accept that a tribunal, uh, um, an arbitral tribunal, or even a state court says, uh, no, the borders should be as they were before? even if it affects a lot of um, other uh, parties that are not within that discussion, like the Federated States that will benefit or will lose with, with this change of regulation? Or uh, will we allow the arbitral tribunal to discuss the financial impact that the change caused in a given contract like it wasn't the case it was the contract that a concession that petrobras had for i don't know 30 40 years and it was um, impacted because it would have to pay more taxes it would have to uh, 
invest more in order to comply with those with this traction in that bigger area and this is a question without answer until now so i i i it's very difficult in some cases because you can challenge the validity of the of the regulation if uh, there were some legality con conditions that were not uh, obeyed, they were uh, not considered. Uh, but if everything was considered, I don't know, I think it's very difficult to to challenge the regulation itself. But it's really, so this is a, a huge discussion. In the United States, you had, uh, you know, where the regulatory agencies are very strong, you had uh, many faces which you authorized judicial review of administrative decisions in uh, phases where you did not authorize them. And this is, I think this is a, a question everywhere where uh, uh, regulatory agencies have a strong um, importance in conducing public uh, policy. But I think it, I hope I could uh, make it more clear to you. So thank you very much. I would ask you to join me in thanking the two speakers for an excellent presentation. And um, I would like then ask you to be back at 25.2, so we shorten the break a little bit, to give the other speakers, which are also all excellent, a chance to present their views. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, so I don't have my role here is basically to present my the, both professors, but anyway, um, I cannot. First of all, my name is Ricardo Apriliano. I'm also Brazilian. I'm one of the vice presidents of CAMCCBC, and we've been organizing this, uh, participating in this event uh, for a while now, and it's an uh, honor for us. And. And not, not enough thank you for Professor Stefan. Uh, uh, we, we have to thank you always, and it's an honor to be here. So this session, we will start discussing merits issues on regarding in, uh, arbitration with state parties. And I have uh, the honor to present both. Both uh, speakers are professors and also practitioners. So first we are gonna hear Professor Massimo Benedetelli. He is full professor of international law. At, he teaches at University Aldo Moro uh, of Bari. He's been doing that uh, for 30 years. So he's, he's some experienced in, in the field. And he's currently at Bocconi University at Milano uh, as well. He's founding far, partner of Arblit, the Milan-based arbitration boutique, and uh, he's also the Italian member of the ICC Court of Arbitration. Uh, after Professor Benedetelli's presentation, we'll have Professor Julia Chernik. She is associate professor at the Inland Norway University of Applied Science, uh, Lilo Hammer, and adjunct associate professor, professor at the University of Oslo. She's also, uh, uh, she's also a practitioner. She has practical experience as arbitration expert in national and international law, and she is an arbitrator under various, various rules. Soon enough, they will both arbitrate under CAM CCBC rules, which, as Luisa said, uh, one of the greatest arbitral institution uh, in the world, and I hope you have the experience to know that and see that I'm not joking at this moment. So, uh, we promise that we will speak uh, enough for you to have questions, and we are, um, I, so, so I invite you to prepare your questions, and those speakers will be very happy to answer after their presentation. Professor Massimo, please.
Well, I start creating progress to Busselius Law School, where it's you know it's a great honor to be here, and I have to thank uh, Stefan Kroll, the organizers. Uh, the first time I was in Hamburg, I had the privilege of sleeping at the Max Planck Institute in Mittelweg because there was even a room for young scholars. And that was my last memory of Hamburg. To be back after some years, it's a pleasure. Uh, I want to handle a very specific issue, which is that of the law applicable to the merits when you have a state or a state entity as party to the arbitration, and I will do that uh, without forgetting that we are in a law school, that I'm a professor, that there are many students, but also keeping in mind that I'm a practitioner, many of you are practitioners of arbitration, so as usual, I will try to be at the same time theoretical and practical. If I'm too theoretical, you can then put questions of a practical nature to me during the Q&A session. Um, just as a start, one of the writers uh, about uh, investment arbitration, which I most prefer, and is someone who is always contributing with his uh, legal mind to the understanding of the phenomenon, Campbell McLachlan, is from New Zealand, but he, he got exactly what investment arbitration is, wrote many years ago that the genius of investment arbitration is the fact of using forms and procedures of commercial arbitration, but for disputes grounded in international laws. It's the combination of these two things. Because he said, you know, uh, party autonomy, which is the foundation of commercial arbitration, and which provides for the ability of the parties to shape the proceedings as they wish, and which provides for both parties having an equal standing before the arbitral tribunal is for the first time applied to disputes which are grounded on public international law, because we are talking about treaties which grant these rights. He is correct, he was correct. However, reading this, something else came to my mind. Um, I'm sure you know the anecdote, the quite politically incorrect anecdote of Isadora Duncan, the famous uh, uh, dancer, uh, telling to uh, her friend, George Bernard Shaw, you know, it would be great if you do a child together because if he gets my looks and your brain, it will be a wonder. And the answer was, yes, you are right, but what if the opposite happens? Um, this draws me to the point that when you mix things, you may enhance virtues but you may also produce the opposite effect of enhancing vices by which the two things you, you, you melt may be affected. What do I mean now trying to be serious? Because this is a serious topic. Um, international commercial arbitration very often sees party autonomy translating into something else, which is arbitral autonomy. The two things are not exactly the same. Uh, sometimes arbitral tribunal do not take the issue of the applicable law seriously enough. Because sometimes it's, it's a difficult issue and they just tell to themselves, as long as my decision is just, commercially sensible, uh, achieving a good business-oriented result, that's what matters. Also because it's very unlikely my decision will be reviewed on the merits, as, as we all know. <clears throat> I don't think this is a correct approach, for the reasons I, I, I will tell you. And uh, this is a vice, not a virtue, of commercial arbitration. Uh, this vice can lead to disastrous results if it combines with another possible vice of uh, claims based on international law. I do believe international law is law, is not politics. Of course, this is debatable, but I do think international law is law. But of course, it's a kind of law where the political dimension may play a fundamental role. And uh, sometimes reading decisions of investment tribunals, one has the feeling that policy considerations prevail over legal considerations. What do I mean? It doesn't matter which is the policy. The policy can be that investors a priori must get a good return to their investment, whatever the legal grounds are or vice versa, states 
have the right to govern their national communities, so whatever they do belongs to their sovereign power. Whatever is the policy behind these standings, it is not correct to under a litigation in this way. One has to take seriously the applicable law. And the problem is that taking seriously the applicable law means to deal with very complicated issues, and sometimes shortcuts are taken. And uh, shortcuts, okay, may be good for practitioners, for members of tribunals, but they may lead to wrong decisions. And too many wrong decisions may, at the end, destabilize the system, may affect the legitimacy of arbitration in general, in particular investment arbitration, but as we discussed today, there is the danger that criticisms against investment arbitration can spread over to commercial arbitration. And this will be the last remark I, I will make for you. Um, in order to follow what I want you to, uh, to understand for me, and I mean, I'm open to challenges, I think I have to go through some trivial, they are trivial, but necessary premises. Uh, which are these premises? And they touch upon issues we already discussed. There are five premises. I will be very short on that, but there are five fundamental premises. I am repeating a bit myself. For those of you who attended the course I gave to the Egg Academy uh, last year, some of this was already there. Uh, but I think it is fundamental, especially for young uh, scholars of uh, international arbitration. We always say, first premise, we always say arbitration is based on party autonomy. And that's correct. But do we really understand what party autonomy means? Party autonomy is not only self-regulation of mutual or conflicting interests. Party autonomy is self-regulation of mutual or conflicting interests by reference to at least one legal system on which the parties regulating their interests rely. Rely to get the enforcement of their contracts or to get the enforcement of decisions settling disputes arising out of those contracts. But when you have a legal system of reference, one or more legal systems of reference, these legal systems protect party autonomy, but very often they put limits, conditions, requirements in order for party autonomy to display its effects. And this is important to be understood also when we deal with the issue, not only, but also with the issue of the applicable law. So this is the first premise. Party autonomy requires understanding which legal system is the one to which the parties refer to enforce whatever they have agreed upon. Second, arbitration. What is arbitration? Settlement of disputes. Sorry, that's not enough. It is the settlement of legal disputes, not of political disputes. Those of you who know the statute of the ICJ know very well that there is a clear distinction there between political and legal disputes. And this is the settlement of legal disputes by means of adjudication. And adjudication is not throwing a coin in the air. Adjudication means legal syllogisms, meaning uh, rules applied to facts, proceedings governed by certain principles in view of a decision that can acquire res judicata effects, can bind the parties, and possibly can be the ground for enforcement. This is adjudication. This is why the so-called baseball arbitration or other funny things whereby parties settle disputes, in my opinion, do not fall within the concept of arbitration to which most arbitration laws refer. And of course, if arbitration is adjudication, a proper understanding of what is the applicable law is fundamental. How can you make the syllogism rules apply to facts if you have no clear ideas where you are going to fish, where you are going to find the rules. And let's remember that adjudicators are not lawmakers. Of course, when an adjudicator has to deal with principles, with vague notions, fair and equitable treatment, he has to give contents, but he has to give contents as an adjudicator, not as a lawmaker. The disaster they are now making in Israel stems from the fact that they seem to not understand that one of the basic concepts of the rule of law is to keep these different functions separate. Uh, of course, you can tell me, but there is also adjudication ex equit bono. Yes, but in most arbitration laws I'm aware of, 
You need an express authorization by the parties. And even when you are adjudicating ex equit bono, you must be transparent about which is the concrete rule that you are going to apply through a sort of reverse engineering. So this is the second premise. Arbitration is not only settling disputes. It is settling disputes through adjudication. You will see this as important impact on, on our topic. Third premise, public international law. We, we, we were told today many times references to public international law. Public international law is not just a set of rules governing the behavior of states. Public international law is a legal system. We are in Germany. You use the expression Rechtsordnung. Rechtsordnung is something different from Gesetz. It is the, the, the rules that govern the relations, but it is also the institutions which apply those rules. It is also the secondary rules, to use the expression of art, that defines the working of the system. It's all this together. And what is international law as a legal system? It is the legal system of a community of states, which uh, uh, treat themselves as equals, uh, recognize each other as sovereign entities with the power to govern their nations, but at the same time understand to be subject to the authority of international law. International law is over the states for the simple fact that it is law. You cannot have a legal system which is not exercising authority over its subjects. And the main subjects of the international community still nowadays are the states. We keep reading articles saying Westphalia is dead. Uh, the, the, the international community nowadays is not anymore that of Grotius. Of course it is different, but it is not so different as far as these basic elements are concerned. Go and tell to the Ukrainian people that sovereignty, territory, nation are uh, old concepts, and that you have now to deal, I, I, I quote, uh, with uh, a new uh, formally transnational trade order where quasi-state actors interplay with states in a sort of at the parity level. This is not reality. Reality is that states still exist, they are still powerful. If they want to exercise full sovereignty in their territory, they can do that, perhaps breaching international law, but they are still able to do that. So, uh, I mean, I'm not suggesting that we are still at the time of Grotius, of course, uh, 1648 is when the uh, peace treaty of uh, uh, Osnabrück and Münster were, were executed. Things have changed, but not in a way that has transformed the basic elements of the international community. Companies, multinational companies, uh, NGOs are active internationally. They are not subjects of international law. The fact that they have some benefits stemming from international law does not mean that they become subjects. Investment protection comes from treaties, treaties which state ex are free to enter into as they are free to denounce, perhaps without having title to withdraw from them, and this will expose the state to liability vis-a-vis -vis other states. Uh, the uh, draft articles on state responsibility are very clear. Uh, uh, they address the issue of responsibility between states. Uh, not between states and individuals or companies. Co companies cannot take countermeasures under international law. They can react, of course, but certainly the breach of an international law obligation is governed by international law in the sense of relations between states. Uh, this has to do with my topic, because as you know, there is a sentence which is repeated. Uh, it was used for the first time by uh, Gabriel Kaufmann Kohler, uh, is a good, she is a good friend and she's a great uh, arbitrator. Actually, this comes from a prior decision where uh, uh, Velde was, was involved. And this is the idea that there is a sort of duty of tribunals dealing with investment protection matters, I quote, to adopt solutions established in a series of constant cases. It is acknowledged that there is no style decisis in international law, but still it is said, we must look to precedents. Why so? Because we have to satisfy the interest of a community of investors and states to an harmonious development of international law. All good, of course. However, there is a danger if we start thinking that there is a community 
not as a sociological notion, but as a legal notion, a community of investors and states which are at the same level. I don't think this corresponds to reality. You have always to start with the relevant treaty. It may be that the relevant treaty can be interpreted in light of other treaties or other uh, decisions given by reference to that treaty, but at the end, the interpretation must be linked to the specific uh, ground of the claim raised by the investor, which comes from a specific treaty, which has to be interpreted according to international law standards. Uh, fourth premise, sorry, I, I was supposed to, to go through the slides. Fourth premise, private international law. Again, in the, in the city where uh, the Max Planck is located, I don't have to explain to you that private international law is domestic law, is municipal law, sometimes harmonized through treaties in, U, in Europe through regulations, but still it is domestic law dealing with cross-border private cross-border matters, tries to achieve the coordination of state private law in connection with cross-border matters. This means that it does not per se apply to arbitral tribunals, because arbitral tribunals cannot be considered a body of any state, are not like courts in that respect. And it also means that private international law cannot govern the relationship between public international law and state law because it, it is not the mission of private international law. However, however, still, arbitral tribunals have to deal with issues of conflict of laws, and when they decide these issues, they have to give reasons, because they are adjudicators. And uh, even when we, we address issues of the relationship between international law and private international law, public international law and private international law, certain concepts developed by private international law scholars can be of use. Because basically, private international law deals with the coordination of legal systems. So concepts like what you, you call in, in German qualification, characterization in English, uh, false conflict, true conflicts, uh, renvoi, uh, fraud à la loi, all this can be used also outside the original domain of private international law. Last uh, uh, premise, transnational law. This is a, an expression which is very, very often used. It has a great appeal. Unfortunately, not matched by a corresponding level of clarity and analytical rigor in what it means. It means at least, at least four different things. Sometimes transnational law is used uh, to mean something which has to do with the relationship between states or between state legal systems. So it is a synonym of international law, public or private. We do not need to make confusion introducing new words. If we mean by transnational that it has to do with the relations governed by law of states, it is public international law. If we mean it has to do with the coordination of state legal system in connection with the regulation of private matters, it is private international law. Second meaning, it has to do with the relationship entities like multinational corporations, NGOs, human rights movements entertain with states. Of course, this happens, and sometimes these entities are even, from an economic or political point of view, more powerful than the, than the states with which they interact. This is, however, a sociological notion. In order to assert the existence of a legal system that would put these entities on the same level, much more evidence has to be brought, and I don't think it exists so far. The most uh, common meaning of transnational law is actually to refer to rules which have developed, especially in connection with business matters. But even there, the meaning of transnational law rules varies. If you take the position of Emmanuel Gaillard, basically Gaillard says transnational rules are the result of the convergence of, of, of trends in state law or convergence of trends in the case law of investment tribunals that go in the same direction. So basically you start from state law and you try to see whether there is a sort of uniform set of rules which is emerging. This is different from referring to transnational law as customs developed by business, because custom is a completely different notion. A third notion is trade usages. You may have in a certain industry sector 
usages of the trade, which of course is not a synonym for custom. Uh, and then you have the famous soft law instruments, which are used as evidence of transnational law. IBA rules, uh, uh, I, I understood there are also Munich rules developed on, on a private basis. That's fine, we can call them transnational law, but it must be clear, they are not custom, they are not trade usages, and they are not the convergence of state law, which Emmanuel Gaillard had in mind. Finally, transnational law is used not to indicate rules, but to indicate a legal system of its own. And again, if you understand Rex Ordnung vis-a-vis -vis Gerecht or uh, law, you understand that one can certainly have rules harmonized by practice emerging from custom, but not necessarily this means that there is a legal system. The famous Lex Mercatoria in the old notion of the 60s or the conception of ordre juridique arbitral proposed by, by Gaillard refer to a legal system. And uh, I have to say, theoretically, of course it could exist. But the question is, does it exist in practice? And I'm with Gary Bourne, when Gary Bourne says, Lex Mercatoria, I quote, is an academic curiosity with little relevance either for business or for international commerce. And I have to say, this is what I see from my observatory at the ICC court. Uh, most of the cases we, we, we receive see the parties having made a clear choice of the seat of the arbitration. And when the parties choose the seat of the arbitration in a certain jurisdiction, they are not only choosing the lex arbitri, they are also conferring jurisdiction to the courts of the state of the seat for the performance of fundamental uh, uh, tasks in connection with the arbitration proceedings, including the fundamental tax or review in the award. Uh, sometimes people say this is done by chance. Uh, well, even if it is done by chance, too bad for the party that was selecting a certain seat vis-a-vis -vis another one without comparing the quality of the laws and the quality of the relevant institutions. In my experience as a practicing lawyer, it is never done by chance. On the contrary, the parties are very careful and they understand what the seat means. But even when they do not choose the seat and they choose institutional rules, most of the institutional rules require the seat to exist and to be placed in a state jurisdiction. I am not aware of any institutional rule that says, well, if the parties have not chosen the seat, this means that they want to have their arbitration floating in the or juridic arbitral or, or whatever. The truth is that if you take the Queen Mary uh, um, uh, uh, statistics, I mean, you know, Queen Mary makes every once in a while these sort of interviews with general counsel, the main feature, the first uh, um, value of arbitration for general counsel of big corporation is enforceability of the award. And the enforceability of the award stems from the New York Convention. And the New York Convention is a treaty, and the treaty requires one or well, better, two or more states to be there in order to, to, to sign it and to give it substance to the, the relevant commitments. Um, uh, so I'm not suggesting, let's be clear, that there is no transnational law. Transnational law exists. Very often it's soft law, but you know, the parties want what is soft to become hard, so for, for, for the pun. Uh, and to get it hard, soft law instruments must have a legal system that accepts them to be binding on the parties. If they remain soft law instruments, the parties are perhaps not making use of them. Uh, with this, I have completed my uh, premises, and we come to the real topic. Uh, if we do deal with the applicable law in disputes involving state or state parties, we have to deal with the interplay of sources of law which are not homogeneous and which have to be coordinated. Uh, because we have to put the questions, are they governed by public international law? Are they governed by state law? And if so, the law of which state? Or are they governed by transnational law, understood as you know, a kind of law which is autonomous from, from state law and puts the parties, investor, for instance, or company and state on, on, the, same, on the same level. Um, these are questions which are difficult to be answered. And also, if you answer to them, then you have to put yourself the question, but how do we coordinate these systems? Because they are different. They are different in nature. L uh, international law is a different legal system than state law. And transnational law, if at all it exists, is a, again a third kind of, of legal system. So 
question mark. The answer, in my opinion, is uh, not very difficult. How you coordinate public international law and state law? Of course, international law is higher. From its point of view, whatever is the position of a single state, dualistic, monistic, it doesn't care. For, for the point of view of international law, international law is higher. In fact, it is a fundamental principle of international law that compliance with state law does not justify the breach of an obligation under a custom uh, law rule or a treaty rule. International law may look at state law as a fact, because sometimes it is a behavior of the state that makes a state responsible. If the state enacts a piece of legislation, takes a, a, an administrative measure, that is a fact, which is relevant for assessing potentially a liability of the state. Or international law may refer to state law as law, because sometimes the rules of international law are not complete. They need to be filled with substance. And it is the international law rule that says, let's look at what uh, state law says. Uh, states are free to comply with international law as they prefer. I mean, the, the system of compliance is left to their discretion. International law does not oblige a state to take a monistic or a dualistic position. Uh, how do you coordinate state laws among themselves, private international law? Uh, and, you know, we don't have to go into the details. Uh, what is the role of transnational law? As I said, it can play a role but you must find a link between a soft law instrument, a custom developed by business, a, a, a practice in a certain industry with the applicable law in a specific dispute which we are dealing with. Uh, how do we handle all this? Answering three different questions or considering three different factors. And to be clear, this applies also to issues of jurisdiction that were addressed before, to issue of procedure, and perhaps to issue of enforcement. First of all, you have to question whether the dispute involving a state party or the state arises from a situation where the state was acting, we have to use Latin, jure imperi or jure gestiones. Second, you have to check whether the arbitral tribunal gets its power to adjudicate from a treaty or from state law. And third, which is fundamental, you have to check whether the claimant was grounding its claim on international law or on state law. These three things intermingle, are not exactly the same, do not correspond to the classic distinction treaty claims, contract claims you find in investment law uh, commentaries, are a bit more complicated. Let's see the first one. A state may enter into relationship with a private party at a vertical level as a sovereign entity or at a horizontal level. States can certainly enter into contracts. States can certainly accept uh, donations. Uh, states can certainly be the source of tortuous uh, uh, liability obligations. Uh, when the state is acting jure gestionis, meaning as a, as a private party, the issue of the applicable law is the same issue you will have if uh, you have a litigation between two private parties. So uh, we don't have the time to go through this, of course, because this requires a, a, a lecture on its own. Uh, uh, normally, you have to abide by what the parties have agreed. So if the parties have chosen a certain law, normally the tribunal applies that law. But let's be clear. Uh, the parties can choose the law applicable to contracts. Sometimes they can choose the law governing obligations in tort. It is more rare that the parties are given by legal systems the power, for instance, to choose the law applicable to insolvency. I mean, there are many areas of the law where the choice of law simply does not operate. So that, that agreement is not, ev even if it exists, because in my experience, normally you see choice of law clauses on the contractual obligations, not any, anything else. But even if there is that, that kind of general choice of law, perhaps is not effective. Uh, second, if uh, the parties have not chosen the law, so there is silence, what is the tribunal doing? Well, the tribunal has to find a way out. There are different methods, but what is important is the tribunal must give reasons why a certain method, be it the WADI rect or whatever, has been chosen and why that method brings to a certain solution. Finally, we have overriding mandatory rules that have to be considered because they imply 
fundamental policy judgments by, by the relevant state. Uh, but let's see what happens when uh, states act, uh, sorry, uh, even when you have uh, uh, actions undertaken by states vis-a-vis -vis parties acting jure in peri, so exercising its power as a sovereign entity, this does not mean there are no legal, possible legal limits. Uh, again, we are in Germany, where even in many years ago, a miller could tell to the king, you know, there is a court in, in Berlin where perhaps uh, my claim is going to be adjudicated. The rule of law is a feature of Western legal systems and leads to constitutional and administrative law limitations within the single law of a single state. But international law, that is outside state law, puts also further limits in customary rules or treaty rules. And the breach of these limits may be vindicated before a court or even before an arbitral tribunal if the relevant legal system provides for this type of litigation. For instance, uh, we discussed today in Brazil, in Italy, uh, you may have uh, administrative law claims submitted to arbitration. So claims that would normally go before an administrative court, because they have to do with limits, administrative law puts the discretion of public powers, can be submitted to arbitration. But that depends on whether the applicable law of the state, domestic law, provides for such a remedy. What about international law? Investment arbitration is one example of a situation where international law can provide you with instruments to react to wrongful behaviors of a state before an arbitral tribunal. And other, uh, this is not an invention, let's be clear, of the last 50 years. Uh, the so-called mixed commissions for uh, deciding on claims about damages stemming from war. We, we discussed this uh, uh, yesterday at the, at the lecture here at Buserius, uh, were already active at the beginning of last century, and they were a way by which international law offered to private parties a remedy before independent uh, uh, commissions. Um, where does the power, this is the second factor to be considered, the power to adjudicate a claim against the state come from? It may come from, okay, arbitration is based, we always say, on consent. But there is a misunderstanding. When consent is based on state law is one thing. When consent is based on a treaty, we have to consider that the first element of consent is the treaty, is not the fact that an investor is accepting the offer to arbitrate. In other words, the real ground of investment arbitration is an intergovernmental agreement whereby the two or more states party to the investment uh, treaty confer the possibility to private parties to sue one of the states in uh, arbitration. And, uh, you know, uh, if you start with the idea that as an arbitral tribunal you are acting on the basis of uh, a contract governed by state law, is completely different than if you take the position that your powers come from a treaty. Because if your powers come from the treaty, you are acting as an international adjudicator. You are acting in a situation which is very similar to, what, to that of an international court. This means that you have to consider the international law legal system as your main reference point. Why so? Because again, your power it's ultimately based on the consent of two states which created this mechanism that empowers private companies to sue, to go into arbitration against the state. Uh, and this is very important, and we come to the last point I want to make. Where is the claim grounded? This is a basic principle of adjudication. Uh, it is the claimant uh, that defines the claim. Uh, it's uh, there since uh, Roman law times. And the claimant defines the claim, first of all, by choosing its counterparty, second, by uh, asserting a certain cause of action, uh, causa petendi, and third, looking for a certain relief, uh, uh, petitum. Now, uh, you may have situations where the claim may be grounded in international law, or situations where the claim may be grounded in domestic law. Uh, normally, if a company is litigating with a state, 
uh, it has to, to, take, to make a decision. And potentially, you may have situations where both avenues are, are open. But uh, uh, remember that you have some investment treaties that contain uh, the arbitration uh, uh, clause, I mean, the clause allowing to submit dispute to arbitration, sometimes is uh, phrased in a very broad way. Sometimes it refers to breaches of the standards of protection contained in the treaty, in which case only claims grounded in international law can be brought into arbitration, otherwise the investor can go to the state courts. But other times the investment treaty says that the investor can bring any claim relating to the investment before an arbitral tribunal. In this case, also claims grounded on contract law or claims grounded on the municipal law of uh, the state hosting the investment can be submitted to arbitration. But even in this case, the arbitral tribunal would be acting under the umbrella, under the authority of a treaty, which means a lot of things. It means that it will have to consider uh, that, uh, you know, uh, let me find the right slide. First of all, when you interpret a treaty, you must follow the rules on treaty interpretation, which are codified in the Vienna Convention. You are not free to interpret a treaty as you can interpret a contract. There are specific rules. And to mistake treaties with contracts, to think that they are the same animal, it's, it's a big mistake. Second, international law has its own hierarchy of sources. Uh, you have use cogens, you have uh, obligation uh, erga omnes, you have even erga omnes partes obligations. The debate about ACMEA, uh, we don't, I didn't have time to cover that, has also to do on the issue of whether, for instance, the European Energy Charter Treaty does or does not create erga omnes partes obligations, so that two member states, two states parties can withdraw without affecting or affecting the position of, of third states. Gap filling sources, the famous general principles of civilized nation that you find quoted at the end of the list of sources in Article 38 of the Statute of the ICJ, sometimes they are mistaken. They have a, a function to fill gaps because international law sometimes is void of content, requires looking at the more evolved, more sophisticated experience of state legal systems. All this is something that tribunals must consider when they are acting by reference to international law, because either the parties have grounded the claim on international law, or because the investment treaty from which they draw their authority refers to arbitration all disputes relating to the investment, including disputes based on uh, a specific uh, uh, provision of state law or, or contract law. Uh, why I'm, you see, I'm a bit passionate on this because I, I read very many times uh, uh, investment awards which uh, leave me a bit unsatisfied in terms of reasoning. Sometimes, again, I see this danger of saying what matters is that we come to the right decision. And most times this is right in the eyes of the investor. Sometimes you can have the opposite. You can have, it is right because it does justice to the power of states to control their own economy, their own social system, and so on. You know, states are free to enter or not to enter into treaties. Once they enter into treaties, they are bound by the treaties. Uh, as a party is free to enter into a contract, and once the contract is signed, the, the party is bound by the contract. Uh, uh, this does not mean, however, that you should not take into consideration legitimate policy requirements of the states. Very often, the investment treaties leave room to interpretation, and this interpretation must be carried out in a proper way. Why so? Because we do risk that the fact that very often decisions cannot be reviewed on the merits is taken as a sort of passport for you know, deciding quickly whatever the arbitrator thinks is the, the best way to do justice. If the parties wanted to confer to the arbitrator the power to do justice, they would refer to uh, arbitration exequit bono. When the parties ask the arbitrators to apply the law, they specify the type of mandate. This means that arbitrators have to take seriously the issue. They have to understand that international law is different than state law. It interplays with state law. State laws interplay with each other through private international law. 
all this is complicated, but not that much if you uh, understand the basic rules of the game. And I hope with this uh, intervention I was helping you to avoid mistakes that sometimes I see in decisions, sometimes even important decisions rendered on these matters. Thank you for your attention. Let me see if my presentation is on. Yeah. When my husband asked me which topic I'm going to, to address today, I told him enforcement problems with state entities. And he told me, your speech is going to be either boring or dark. Boring because uh, it will be in your convention and you will be just repeating articles for non-enforcement, Article 5, and probably you will draw hard and dark stories of public policy, arbitrability, uh, non-notification, or some others, uh, widely used reasons for non-enforcement. Or it will be dark, because you need also to show some other and entertain your audience by some other dark stories, like problems with foreign currency exchange, or problems with calculation of interest at the execution stage, or some others. So we will see, but I think I don't have time to be either boring or dark. I need to be quick. So let us see what I will manage to do in these minutes I have. So uh, I was thinking how to, to structure this topic. So um, my perspective will be somewhat different. I will try to focus on what is not usually under radars and that is a uh, separate legal entity alter ego, something which we have already uh, had an opportunity to reflect upon when we discussed jurisdiction and sovereign immunity. But before doing that, I will give you, I will offer you some uh, historical highlights, uh, my personal observations. I will share um, uh, some information on the research project we are doing in Oslo, um, where we focus on investment treaty arbitration, but the knowledge we get uh, can be quite useful also for considering in contract-based arbitration. And um, as I said already, I will try to entertain you by some new and um, I think uh, rapidly developing area to watch out. So three historical highlights from me. When we are talking about state um, entities, in historical perspective, we can observe that uh, here we have some liberalization. And that liberalization primarily relates to the um, understanding that public entities can participate in arbitration. And we have numerous examples of uh, confirmations for this liberalization trend historically. It's like uh, narrowing the scope of non-arbitrable issues, or adoption of the European Convention on International Commercial Arbitration, which expressly permitted public entities to participate in arbitration and subjected any limitations to the reservation of the states. We can also see that uh, it's more or less commonly accepted that uh, when states participate in arbitration, they accept jurisdiction, but we do not have the same assumptions on execution. And this is something I will turn back to. We have also a historical development where we have this New York Convention. We have public international law consent which uh, covers more than 170 countries and which provides a minimum standard for enforcement of arbitral awards, the area which my husband told a boring one. And we have a interesting and probably not uh, that um, uh, currently uh, debatable perspective that compliance with arbitral awards turned from non-issue to a problem. Of course, we have in this room a lot of practitioners, and they do know that to enforce arbitral award and actually to lead it to uh, compliance is a, is a difficult exercise. But this perception that compliance is a problem was not always like this. And I 
like to read a lot about historical perspectives and arbitration. And this book is from 1977. And if you have a chance to have this book from your library, I encourage you to have a look, particularly for those interested in institutional development in arbitration. This book is a, one of the first statistical observation of arbitral institutes existing at that time. And I put here a citation from the Zurich Chamber of Commerce, but uh, similar answers were received from other tribune, uh, from other institutes, ICC, SCC. The point was when institutes were confronted with the question, do you see compliance with your words? They were answering, we assume compliance. We think that everybody comply, but we don't know for sure. Of course, nowadays our perspective is more nuanced. We know that there is no automatic compliance with arbitral awards. And uh, the knowledge which we have or might have depends on academic initiatives. And here I would like to say some words on academic project which we have at the University of Oslo. I want to uh, uh, say clearly once again, this project is focused on treaty-based arbitration. I know that this conference and we are uh, talking uh, more about contract-based uh, arbitration. But uh, in this project, uh, what we are doing, we are assembling empirical data on compliance with awards by states in investment treaty arbitration, and we are doing a database. This project is funded by Norwegian Research Council, and it is for four years, and we are almost done with our database. Uh, and this database would enable both practitioners, but also uh, academics, to look and to see whether actually states comply, when do they comply, how they comply, in which jurisdictions they comply, whether the states prefer to enter in post-award settlement agreements, uh, whether uh, at what perspectives we uh, have about uh, sovereign immunity, etc. And a lot of knowledge we have already accumulated in this project is quite transferable to contract-based arbitration, in particular in what relates to sovereign immunity. The preliminary results of this project were presented at the uh, Ancetral in uh, January at the session, uh, and uh, I led a work of the Academic Forum on ISDS, and we produced a quite short paper, uh, which is uh, publicly available and easily uh, to be found on the internet on compliance with ISDS awards empirical perspectives. And we answered some questions about whether states comply or not. Many of you today were at the um, guiding tour at the Alp Philharmonium. And probably you noticed, uh, at least we were told, that uh, the walls are perforated and, uh, for acoustic reasons. So the results we have in this project is, looks also like a perforated plate because we know as much as we don't know. States do not share a lot of information and uh, we base our uh, sources on publicly available information, publications in GAR, but also interviews with uh, public officials. So when we are addressing enforcement problems, um, and you already know that I discarded an alternative to look at Article 5 of the New York Convention, we can potentially think about recognition versus actual execution. There are also some other interesting topics here on sanctions and uh, coming originally from Ukraine and being qualified in uh, Ukrainian law, I can say to you that the practice is not uniform and we have quite interesting development recently where Supreme Court um, refused to enforce uh, some awards, um, primarily relying and interpreting um, sanctions regulations, national sanctions regulations. There could be also some alternative solutions which could potentially entertain you even more if I choose, but I haven't chosen to talk about this. Award is a property and opportunity to go to European Court of Human Rights for protecting uh, your interest, or award as an investment, and going the second turn, uh, this time already to investment treaty arbitration. What I have chosen is just two or three slides which are, remain, so I hope that I will be in time. So um, the perspective I'm inviting you to consider relates to separate legal entity and alter ego perspective. 
this is a, an interesting uh, area, which currently we do not have sufficient academic research in this field. We miss empirical knowledge about this. What we only have is some scarce description of actual cases where courts of different countries actually extended uh, enforcement to state instead of some state-related entities. And we do have some limited coverage of comparative, uh, I cannot say research, but really coverage of some national regulations and different approaches under national law to extension of execution to state. And today when we discuss jurisdiction, there was a question on the, whether it actually helps to extend, whether it is uh, productive or counterproductive uh, within the procedure to extend jurisdiction to state instead of state-related entity. And the answer is both. It can be productive and counterproductive. And in execution stage, it's also counterproductive and productive, depending on, on the situation. If we are facing the situation where um, a state-related entity is restructured, has nothing, or dissolved, then there is a um, urgent need to extend to the state. But it can be also counterproductive where the state is actually agreeing of being an alter ego to invoke sovereign immunity. And we have already such cases, and the cases I'm talking about for this particular situation comes from the Russian Federation, and they are already reported. So uh, as a starting point of extending already at the execution stage, so this stage can be either within the enforcement procedure, but most likely after the enforcement at the execution stage, is that separability of a legal entity should be respected as a rule. But, and here, depending on a national regulation, if no effective separate existence uh, of this entity, or if this entity is so closely intervened or confused. And here I put these terms in generic form, but all these peculiar conditions depends on applicable national law and a mixture of uh, legislative provisions and case law depending on jurisdiction we are talking about. Uh, a legal entity cannot, uh, can be not regarded as a distinct from the state and enforcement or execution can be extended, extended to, to the state. You would ask me whether this is uh, something which is booming and we have a lot of practice. No, we don't have a lot of practice here so far I'm aware of and I tried to, to, to look at uh, available uh, jurisprudence and that should be so. So that should not surprise us that there is no much practice, but there is some, and this practice is interesting and raise practical and academic considerations. And if we extend to the state, then the next question would be about sovereign immunity. And here we have uh, an interesting um, perspective because uh, uh, sovereign immunity is the last barricade. That is a, an interesting paradox. Uh, states or state-related entities, while agreeing to arbitration, they agree only to jurisdiction. And quite uh, in majority of cases, and doctrinally, jurisdiction and execution are treated separately. An agreement to jurisdiction does not amount automatically to agreement to execution. So in other words, sovereign immunity remains the last barricade against execution. And which rules govern sovereign immunity? This is, again, uh, an interesting question. Because we do have customer international law. We do have international law here. We do have a convention which hasn't come into force, but it doesn't mean that uh, some provisions of this convention are not representative of uh, the status of customer international law. But at the same time, we have plenty of national regulations which approach the uh, issue of sovereign immunity differently. and. Uh, even within national regulation, this can be procedural questions, burden of proof, standard of proof, and some other procedural questions, but it can be also substantive, of course, questions. There, in sovereign immunity, we have also the uh, debate about types of property. And I see here colleagues from Sweden, which probably also uh, will remind the audience in questions or in the comments uh, that not only 
type of property, but use of property might also be a, an important dimension for uh, discussing question of sovereign immunity. And uh, here I try to visualize that, uh, of course, diplomatic protection, uh, diplomatic property is uh, is immune, um, and military. Um, uh, weapons uh, and central bank and cultural objects. So all these type of objects, uh, property objects, uh, have a peculiar statu status. For central immunity, we had an opportunity last time to um, yesterday to hear some perspectives during the uh, the lecture. We heard that central bank. Uh, it is quite uh, debatable. Um, there is undebatable part that the majority of funds of the central bank, uh, which relates to the exercise of the uh, functions of the central bank, are immune from execution. But there are also some funds which are not primarily linked to the exercise of the function, and thus uh, they can be uh, not protected by sovereign immunity. So we have also quite of interesting uh, area and the mixture of national and international rules. So the point I'm trying to say here is that state entities, when they uh, involve um, and when we have a perspective of uh, enforcing and executing a word against state entity, this question of sovereign immunity, which remains under radars, might be quite central and uh, raises a lot of interesting questions and perspective. And this is my actually uh, pre-final or final uh, slide about waiver. Of course, when we talk about sovereign immunity, we talk about waiver. And again, um, the uh, approach to waiver varies uh, depending on jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions may recognize only expressed waiver against execution, but others may also consider restrictively, but still consider implied waivers. Waivers can be generic and specific, reciprocal or not reciprocal. And we have here in the room a lot of representatives of arbitral institutes. Uh, so it might be also interesting to challenge you, and uh, because you are innovators, uh, and you have more probably flexibility and uh, brevity to innovate, and probably what states cannot agree upon, you can try either by model agreements or even as a radical revolution in the arbitration rules where you can probably try to say that if a state entity is involved, it's not only a um, wave of jurisdiction, but also wave of execution. Then, of course, you need to calculate what would be the implications that states will choose you, but they, that might have an interesting, um, at least, warp try of doing. I see that Vienna uh, International Arbitral Center, they have introduced uh, investment rules. They put expressly that agreement to these rules means waiver uh, of um, jurisdictional ob objections, but not execution. So they, I assume, evaluated this question. But it might be interesting to start this challenge and to see where it will lead us. But we will conclude here. So um, I have a boring conclusion that enforcement against state entities is a complex question. And I have an entertaining conclusion and open to further curiosity that it is also country and case specific question under development. Thank you very much. What was your husband's worries, uh, dark or boring? Yeah. Definitely not none of them, definitely. Um, well, thank you, professors, for your presentations. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I, anyone interested? I have my own, but okay. Professor Crow, please. Thank you, Julia, for your excellent presentation. I have one question concerning the um, piercing of the corporate veil you mentioned there. Um, I think that's one of the crucial issues uh, because most of the state property is 
protect it from uh, immunity from execution. And the way they structure it, it's more and more that it's protected from immunity from execution. So you're left with state entities, um, which to some extent may have a lower level of protection from immunity from execution. Are you aware of any examples where that has happened already or where parties have successfully tried to enforce awards which have been rendered against the state into the property of a state entity closely related to the state? I'm sitting and reading every day uh, cases relating to treaty-based arbitration because we are just at the final stage of completing this uh, database. I cannot recollect exactly the names, but we see attempts of uh, rendering or toning enforcement against uh, uh, some entities of states or some alter ego of states when the award itself is rounded against the state. So the either way which I presented uh, during the presentation. So uh, there are some examples, uh, not numerous, but I, I need just to, uh, to come back to you to, to give precise, uh, precise names. Yeah, and uh, just if somebody is curious about this database, what, what we are doing, we are assembling information on various jurisdictions. So some cases we see uh, uh, that attempts are to turn, for instance, um, enforcement execution against membership payment that the state is uh, uh, paying to some international organizations and uh, to just to catch this money or when the entity of the state is paying for international aviation or some other some, some other uh, international organizations so uh, i think we will uh, in future we will see a lot of development here particularly uh, because of this um, current situation uh, where we we have uh, complicated relationships and where the chase for state assets might be uh, unavoidable for, for many. Okay, over there. Thank you very much, very interesting. Ginta Aurel from Stockholm. Uh, to, to answer Stefan's question, there we are seeing some uh, awards rendered against the state, or a, an award rendered against the state where enforcement has been sought and, and uh, received in the funds of um, sovereign wealth funds. Uh, they come in all different shapes and forms, but we've seen um, a seizure of assets of a sovereign wealth fund that is recognized as a separate legal personality. But that's, of course, very close to alter ego. Over there, please, in the middle. Um, hi, thank you for your interesting presentation. I had a question as to the enforcement of certain investment awards when um, the states in question are under financial distress. Uh, Professor Mart Martin Paparinskis wrote an interesting paper on crippling compensation and how sometimes it would be almost immoral to enforce these awards. Have you seen from your research any sort of indication that there might be a rising trend of certain courts at enforcement stage just staying proceeding, so not necessarily giving enforcement to particular awards just by taking that into account. I know ICSID has been very reluctant to do that. In, let's say, by a state court perspective, do you think it's some, something that could happen and it's something worth looking into for the future? Thank you. No, we, we don't see. Uh, probably we will come across some uh, real uh, examples, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, we don't see uh, this, yeah. Well, we have three minutes. Let me ask you uh, both uh, two questions. And, and sorry, if, uh, so for, for Julia, my question is based on the fact that in Brazil we don't have investment arbitration. Uh, what is more common or what do you see more often? When, when you have a, an award against a state, the enforcement of that award before the, the state or 
trying to look for assets of this state in another state, in another, another jurisdiction. Yeah, th this comes to one of the important aspect of what we are doing. We see um, uh, the same number of jurisdictions which are quite often used if we have reluctant host state. So if you are unable or you know that you will be unable to perform, investors uh, are trying to enforce in the uh, United States, UK, Belgium, France. So there is a, a number and this number is quite repetitive. So this, uh, num uh, this scope of states create a certain pattern where uh, investors are trying uh, to, uh, um, uh, to enforce in these uh, particular jurisdictions. What we also see is that once the parties um, start all these proceedings in various countries, quite often they come to post award settlement agreement. And that was a, a, a real surprise to me. I thought that post award settlement agreement, of course, is something which is practiced, but I didn't uh, think that it is so often. So we see a lot of uh, post award settlement agreements. Uh, uh, at, I, I'm discussing in one of the drafts I'm writing with Mavluda Satarova around 60 uh, post award settlement agreements. So this is also a kind of uh, reality uh, of uh, enforcement where states agree to enforce, but uh, of course on uh, some different conditions than the initial arbitral award. And Massimo, um, according, uh, uh, about applicable law, uh, how, I don't know if I should say how often, or if I should say, have you seen uh, a state decide, uh, agreeing that the applicable law will be of the, the investor jurisdiction, the merits of the investor, or a third country? So I'm investing in, in one well, particular that, that, country? Yeah, that, no, that depends, again, whether you have a commercial or investment dispute. Because if you have an investment dispute, very often you may have a situation where you have the investment treaty, take ICSID. The ICSID has a provision, which is Article 42, which says, seems to say that the parties, so the investor and the host state, are free to determine the applicable law. So theoretically, I haven't seen that in practice, but theoretically you could have a situation where the host state says, well, our relationship is governed by the laws of, of your state of nationality or even a third state. However, uh, again, um, if you go through the very debated question of what Article 42 of the Dixit Convention really means, you will see that very often you come with completely different uh, positions among scholars, but also among arbitral tribunals. And the reason is that uh, uh, the parties will, meaning the investor and the host state will, cannot overcome the will of the national state of the investor and of the host state when they were agreeing on a bilateral investment treaty or a multilateral investment treaty. Because, of course, they were acting at a different level. And uh, the state of the investor was disposing of its own rights because in exchange of waiving to diplomatic protection, it grants the benefit of arbitration to the investor, but it is its own right in the diplomatic protection. So it is not left to the full autonomy of the parties. We have to check what the treaty really uh, wanted to say. But again, in real life, it is quite a, would be quite unusual to see a state accepting expressly in a choice of law provision that uh, the matter is governed. A again, if you talk about investments, if you, if you talk about normal relationship, uh, co contractual relationship, why not? Even though I, I can imagine a certain reluctance uh, also in, in, in that context. Okay, so uh, thank you again for both of you. It was very um, uh, interesting and, and I at least learned a lot. We will have a break of 10 minutes and then we come back. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you to take your seats, please? We now come to what we call our moot court lecture, meaning the lecture on one of the topics, arbitration topics, which figures prominently in the moot court. And it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce my friend Claudia Finkelstein from the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo. Um, 
you can read about his numerous academic achievements online. I'm just saying something personal. Um, I spent a wonderful time in Brazil at his, uh, yeah, at his holiday house in the mountains, and we share something, love for football. So we went to several games, watched it, and he even convinced my wife to visit with me the Museum of Football in Sao Paulo. <laughs> so that is one of the greatest success he has, and he's one of the most positive person I know. So Claudio, I thought there's no one better to talk about a sad topic, meaning corruption and bribery, as someone as positive as you. The floor is here, Claudius. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Councillor uh, Sebese, for the kind invitation. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, not to talk about football, because, I mean, not even Brazil or Germany, we're, we're not that much into it as we speak. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, to be talking about corruption. Uh, not that I like it, but uh, apparently it likes me. Uh, I've, I've, uh, in the only sense acceptable, I mean, uh, I've, I've been doing a lot of uh, research and work on, on, on the topic of corruption. And uh, not surprisingly, I absolutely love the, the Vismut case uh, of this year. Uh, to be quite honest, uh, after uh, spending some time in, in pre moods and I just, I'm, I'm actually arriving right now from Hong Kong, uh, participating in the Viz East. Uh, the topic of corruption is not coming up, uh, basically not at all, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> on, on, on the topic of, of the applicable law. Uh, we have a few discussions whether uh, the CISG should encompass uh, uh, corruption and, and misrepresentations and frauds. Uh, I'll, I'll be uh, marginally talking about it. Uh, as a Brazilian, of course, we have a, a lot of experience with, with corruption. So uh, uh, without further ado, let's, let's try to to, to get into the, the actual topic that we, we're gonna be talking about. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I was about to give up on, 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 on writing about corruption because I've had some problems and, and then I was talking to Stefan and uh, right after the Divismo case was out, so I decided to keep on uh, uh, researching and writing a academic thesis on, on, on corruption. So basically what I have here is the sketch, it's an outline of uh, an ongoing research. So if any of you guys have any question, any doubt, please do let me know because that might be a uh, good hint for me to further develop and to further research. And uh, if you have any material, uh, mostly in English or, or Spanish, no German, I'm sorry. Uh, please feel free to send me, I'd love to get uh, material from whatever jurisdiction. So uh, my main topic here is uh, change in times, change in ethics, change in morale, change in basically everything that we've, we've been experiencing. And it has nothing to do with uh, chat GDP and, and artificial intelligence and, 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 and so forth. Uh, for those of you, and I see a lot of young people here, so you might not uh, relate to what I say, uh, corruption uh, back in the days, and I'm talking about last century, which was not that long ago, I mean, we're talking about 20, 20 some years ago. Uh, to be quite honest, corruption was uh, not a big thing. I mean, it did exist, we had, uh, great many cases of corruption, but for most of us, and this is my main issue, uh, corruption was about corrupted issues. And, and most of us, uh, 
gray hair, old timers, uh, we will basically relate, at least to me, first time I heard about the word corruption and I really stopped to care about it, uh, was uh, with the computer. So when you had this file is corrupted, so you had to, yeah, I, I hear a lot of uh, loss. You had to reboot the whole system. You had to uh, start over. So the actual meaning of corruption to me and, and to my paper is it's not working. If it's not working, it's corrupted. And if it's corrupted, it needs fixing. Uh, which comes to say that we come to a time in which some level of corruption is acceptable. Question is, uh, where is the threshold? Where, is, uh, where do we draw the line? And it seems that the whole world is going that direction. So I'm sorry it has not much to do with the Vismut case, although I'd be happy to answer questions about uh, the Vismut case. Uh, once the setting for, for my research is set, uh, we have, actually we have uh, to basically understand what kind of corruption we're talking about. Uh, well, talking about Vismut case, I have to give another example. Uh, we arbitrators like examples. Uh, that was long ago, basically the same uh, uh, time we had a, a show. Uh, U2 was in Brazil, and it was really hard to buy tickets. I mean, back then we didn't have Ticketmaster, we didn't have online tickets, so we had to go to the booth and buy ticket. So we went to the ticket, and there was a huge line. Uh, by we, I mean me and my cousin. Uh, there was a huge line, and there was uh, the preferential booth for basically the elderly, and it was empty. We were not elderly by that time. So what we did, I look at my cousin, he looks at me. We went to my grandmother's house. We took her to buy the tickets with us. We, went, we had a wonderful afternoon, afternoon tea. My grandmother was really happy uh, to be of help, and it was... I mean, in Brazil, it was the law. I mean, it, there, there's a law determining the number of tickets. Uh, it was pretty obvious. I mean, my, back then, my, my grandma was probably 80, so she wouldn't go for a rock concert. And the day after, one of the major newspapers in Brazil had in the cover, like, are the ethics of the country changing? and questions and answers. And the very first question was, would you take a relative, a elder familiar, to buy tickets for a concert? And my answer was, yes. <laughs> of course, not, not only would I, I actually did it. And, and, and I think that was the highlight of the month for my grandmother, by the way, and for me too, because I got tickets and my cousin. I mean, we, we had a great time. Everybody had a great time. There is nothing illegal. There is, I mean, that was highly anticipated that, I mean, we're talking about almost 40 years ago. U2 was not for that public. And, and back then, elderly in Brazil, oh, well, still at 65 plus. Uh, so question is, are our ethics changing? And my conclusion, of course, I have to work on it. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, uh, for the Vismut case, we have a number of red flags. What are red flags? Uh, are those clues evidence? How are we to treat them? How are, since we asked about threshold and, and where is the law, uh, where is the line draw? Uh, it is what we always hate to work with? The answer is always, it depends. Uh, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, and, and we'll see. Of course there are, uh, I'm, I'm not going on, on, on item by item, because, I mean, we all know how to read, so we don't have to go there. 
Uh, we're talking about uh, underlying corruption. I mean, we're not talking about uh, corruption of the arbitrators or corruption uh, within the procedure itself, although I have uh, laundering proceeds of, 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 of crime. But uh, we're talking about the contract, and, and it's really important to draw the line somewhere. Uh, although, as you might imagine from what I'm saying, is I mean, this is a very fluctuating line as we have it right now. Because uh, we could have, I mean, the concept of, of, of petty theft and grand theft are clear. But what exactly is uh, petty for arbitration purposes? Uh, I'm not entering into uh, discussions on, on, on powers of arbitrators or uh, efficiency of arbitration or, or even legitimacy of arbitration. Although, uh, I don't, I don't see Massimo anymore. Uh, but he, he entered, I, I, I believe, oh, there you are. Thank you very much uh, for entering. First, uh, we were setting grounds. Uh, to my mind, uh, corruption is now part of uh, use cogens. Uh, we had, I mean, it was uh, nearly uh, widely accepted that piracy uh, is part of uh, the I mean, the combat of piracy is, is part of use cogens, and, and we're moving towards uh, a moment in which nearly every single jurisdiction ousts uh, in some form a corruption. Uh, we have a concept that there has to be further study of speed money in, in which some jurisdictions would allow uh, and sometimes even encourage some sort of uh, corruption, but it's a corruption that is not detrimental to development. So we have the cases of China, we have uh, some cases in Central and South Africa, uh, we have Brazil, for instance, we have, uh, I mean, not long ago I would also say Argentina, but it's, it's not the case anymore. But we have a number of jurisdictions in which we see some sort of development in, in highly corrupt uh, uh, jurisdictions. We have uh, 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 ongoing discussions on, on the role of uh, the law. Uh, and once again, thank you, Massimo, because uh, quite often I get this question from my students. I mean, what is the difference between uh, an international arbitration and a domestic arbitration. Some people say those are completely different issues, those are completely different animals sometimes, some people say. And I say the, the, the only relevant difference is, is the applicable law. But of course, when you have uh, different applicable law, you have everything. Uh, the rights and duties of the parties, uh, deadlines, uh, even jurisdiction. Uh, they vary enormously from uh, the principles underlying the contractual relationship or the treaties, if it's public. Uh, they change completely. And, and once you have uh, this uh, setting to be uh, taken into consideration, things uh, could get a lot worse. So just like Ricardo mentioned, uh, for us Brazilians, and Brazil is, is the only relevant actor in the the international scenario that has uh, no operative uh, bilateral investment treaty. We're not party to the Washington Convention and we don't have any exit arbitration, but on the other hand, we have a lot of uh, international arbitration and we have a lot of investment. So depending on which year we're talking about in Brazil, we're either the eighth or the twelfth largest uh, economy. Last year alone, uh, in direct foreign investment, we received $108 billion U.S. dollars in direct investment. So straight on investment. Uh, there's a whole lot more in indirect and, and state regulated uh, investments. So Brazil is a player, is, is, is a relevant player, and we're, we're very much plagued by, by, by corruption. I mean, uh, last government was bad, and, and the new government is bad. I mean, we, we, we've been going bad and bad, from bad to worse, and, and 
no good prospects, quite honestly, unfortunately. So, once again, we have uh, uh, this, this problem of uh, where is the line, where is the threshold? And just like I said, and based on, on Massimo's uh, lessons, uh, we have also to distinguish uh, our arbitration. We're not, we're not focusing, and, and the Vismut case also does not focus on, on investment arbitration, but in general, commercial arbitration is between private parties, and investment arbitration is between or amongst public parties, I mean, states or state agencies or trade blocks. And the applicable law, as we said, I mean, the difference is, is, is the applicable law, but applicable law for investment arbitration is public international law. So we're basically talking about the law of the treaties. There are a lot of uh, bilateral treaties. There are contracts, regulations. There are rules that would mingle into the obligations of the parties. But uh, this is pretty much the rule. And for what we call these... Uh, in this commercial arbitration, this, this is uh, language from one of my Moody's, okay? By the way, it says, I liked it. Uh, we have, we have uh, uh, different interplay. Although in investment arbitration, uh, the actors are somewhat different because you have uh, a private entity, you don't have as a primary source of law, private law. So in commercial arbitration, you have a secondary role of public law, and in investment arbitration, you have a secondary role of private law. And in investment commercial arbitration, the same would apply based on, on the, privacy, the, the, the primacy of uh, uh, private law. But of course, public policy and, and moreover, the public interest of one state will come into play. So when we say it's on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, it would vary a lot what we have to do. Uh, for the Visma problem, it's really important, as, as I see, and, and actually I focused a lot on, on the difference between jurisdiction and, and admissibility. Uh, once again, in, in, in Hong Kong, that has not surfaced. I mean, not many people are really concerned about it. I see is a big problem. Uh, we'll see in the next slide that we have uh, gone a long way from uh, 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 the, the duty-free case and, and the ICC uh, corruption case. So we're going on, on a different trend and on a different... Uh, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't like to say that we, we, we're getting to a, a stage in which uh, corruption is not only acceptable, but it's also uh, desired in some instances. But lately we've seen, I mean, for those jurisdictions I just mentioned, I mean, it comes a lot, but we have a number of uh, corruption-related cases in Europe, in Germany, we have uh, in France, we have in Japan, we have basically all over. I just heard, I have no idea, I don't know if there are any North American here. Uh, they may, I, just this week I've heard that in the US they have reenacted for uh, income revenue purposes the mandatory declaration of bribes received. So that was a rule from the prohibition, like uh, dating 60, 70 years ago the very one that got Al Capone, uh, they say that it's, it's back in the rules for the IRS. So if you receive the, it's non-deductible, of course, it's non-deductible. Otherwise, I myself would probably declare some. Uh, not really. Uh, I just started saying that I'm honest, I'm ethical, so I wouldn't declare. Uh, but we, we see that coming up in, in a number of jurisdictions. And I have uh, in the slides, I don't know if, are you going to send the slides to people? I mean, whoever wants the slide, just, you can ask me or Stefan or anyone. We have two very recent cases in which this has come up 
uh, well, I just mentioned uh, the issue of uh, uh, jurisdiction and admissibility. And once again, uh, we have uh, also, in terms of uh, arbitration protection, or if you're uh, more towards uh, a private law view or a public law view, but in general, the main difference is uh, where your power comes from. Uh, jurisdiction, uh, for those versed in Latin, which is not my case, but the very basic I know, Yuri's diction is to say the law. So if you have this capacity to say the law, you can decide, and you can decide in matters of admissibility if the claim is admissible or not, uh, or even if the matter, the subject matter is arbitrable. I mean, if it's not arbitrable, such as criminal law, such as in, in many jurisdictions, I mean, criminal law is in most jurisdictions. Actually, I know of no jurisdiction that would allow arbitration on criminal matters, but uh, in, in social security, uh, there are a number of, in family law, most jurisdictions would not allow uh, uh, arbitration in family law. So if it's not allowed under the applicable law to the contract or to the act itself, uh, it's a matter of jurisdiction. If you do not have this uh, venue, if you do not have this route, you cannot go to arbitration. Uh, you can always go to the court or to other administrative procedure in, in case of family law, of course. Uh, oh, others as well. But sometimes uh, you have the power, so you have jurisdiction, and you decide that the claim is not admissible because of uh, the clean hands doctrine, for example, in our case, or for some other uh, uh, issue that once you decide that you have jurisdiction and the claim is not admissible, uh, all doors are closed. So you have a final binding decision. Uh, of course, this decision, depending on how it's handled, it can be reviewed or not. And once again, public policy plays a different and very important role depending on which jurisdiction you want to enforce this decision, the award. So that's uh, one of the uh, main issues that I'll have to exploit. And it's going to be fun. Uh, so just, 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 just like I said, uh, early 60s, uh, we had the, the, the infamous uh, 1110, ICC 1110, uh, in which uh, it was a case of Argentina, of course. It's always South America. It's either we or our neighbors. Uh, you see the both, both cases that I picked. The most recent cases, I know Brazil is involved. Um, so basically, uh, uh, Judge Lagergreen, he was uh, terrified by the very fact of uh, uh, you have tainted your contract and you want to redress. So it was uh, uh, the essence of the clean hands doctrine and he denied jurisdiction. Uh, we have uh, moved far from that. I, I, my, my recent research has shown, at least not in this century, any case in which uh, one such, does, I mean, we might find it. Uh, actually, for the Vismo purposes, I, I think that, that could be exploited. Because, uh, I mean, you could have old-fashioned arbitrators, you could have uh, very traditional ethics. Uh, I, was, I was also talking to uh, some people and I remember I was in Japan about 15 years ago. It was 2007, I was in Japan and I was uh, in a city close to Kyoto and it was about 11.30, almost midnight. I wanted to go to McDonald's and I was asking at the lobby of the hotel if it would be safe for me to walk out. I mean, I walk four or five blocks and the clerk, he actually did not understand my question. 
of course, I mean, being Brazilian, by safe I meant, I mean, am I going to be mugged? Am I going to be run over? I'm, uh, I mean, I'm going to get in the, I mean, shot by a crossfire or a friendly fire or something. But for the Japanese guy, it was, I mean, it was out of his reality. And, and he would look at me and say, oh, no, no, it's not, not snowing. No, no sleeper. No. I said, I mean, am I going to get mugged? And he would go like, why? <laughs> why would anyone do that? I said, well, go to Brazil, ask my friends. I, mean, like, uh, I don't know. I mean, that was my, my major concern. And, and he was absolutely, I mean, he, he actually wanted to talk about it. Because meaning that depending on, on, on the ethics of the person, uh, I had worked with, with some Swiss uh, really... Aged people, they, they had a hard time understanding what was doing business in Brazil like. Uh, not for amateurs, as we say. Uh, but very nice. I mean, in a very nice way. It's, it happens, but life goes on. For most people, some... Brazil. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it might happen. I'm, I'm not going to go over those principles because, I mean, you're all sick and tired of it and, and this, this being long established. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this, this is... Uh, uh, look, I promised Stefan that I wouldn't go over half hour and I see I've, I've, I've done 27 minutes already. So, I... <laughs> I, I, Louisa just said, I mean, you give him the mic, he likes to talk. Uh, let me talk to you guys about two very recent cases. This is, this is a case from December 2022. So we have uh, Brazil as, I mean, a lot of people think about Brazil as, as uh, football, carnival, but we do a lot of manufacturing and, and I mean, we're the third largest exporter of uh, aircrafts and we're the fourth largest exporter of guns, uh, uh, armored vehicles. And, and, and that was uh, a, a contract between the government of Brazil, not the government, I mean a private manufacturer of uh, guns, I have no idea what kind of guns we're talking about, to the government of Bolivia. Uh, all of a sudden, this very same contract was assigned to a company in Florida, the United States of America. Uh, talking about red flags, Basically, nothing changed in the contract in terms of uh, deadlines for delivery, payment terms, and even price. But a new company in a new jurisdiction come up, and they were buying for the same very price with delivery to be undertaken the very same way as it was before. So, I mean, you don't have to be smart to see a number of red flags here. I mean, what are red flags? Are clues? I mean, are clues evidence? No, they're not evidence. But I mean, we have. I bet you have something in German that says where there's fire, the where there's smoke, there's fire. We have that in Portuguese. We have that in Spanish, and I think even in English they have that. So it was pretty obvious, and uh, uh, actually. They filed a claim in court in the U.S. and the Brazilian company was excluded. Not only it was excluded, uh, the appeal court, they said, well, far from a conspiracy, this is common, rather routine business practice. And there were all red flags you could think of. Those are Brazilian companies. And, and uh, we have another case, very interesting, that's, uh, uh, that was uh, appeal court, the Supreme Court of the state of Florida. And we have another court in Singapore. So Singapore is probably as fierce as the US in, 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 
its international struggle against uh, 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 corruption. So, once again, we have Petrobras. Petrobras uh, was involved in a number of uh, illicit acts, and uh, uh, this particular one, uh, you see, I'm, I'm at the early stages of my uh, research. Uh, what we see here, and I have absolutely no evidence to that, that sense, is that th this case has been going on in Brazil, it has been going on in Singapore, it has been going on in the US as well, because those are huge companies. Uh, it's been settled in Brazil in court, it's been settled in the US in court as well, and in Singapore they decided not to pursue, uh, just, just January this year, they, they decided not to pursue uh, they actually dropped the claim, apparently because six people of uh, the board of uh, Keppel, this, this, this company, uh, they're highly involved with uh, the royal, I don't, I don't think they have a royal family. I mean, like, I think Singapore is a dictatorship or something like it. It's, I have no idea. See, remember, I'm, I'm at the early stage. And actually, I heard about that just this week in, in Hong Kong because I was talking to some people from Singapore. So what do we have here? We have a changing environment. Uh, I, I read a lot about the Volkswagen case. Uh, apparently, people in Germany, they don't like it. They don't like it, but uh, the accepting uh, friends from telecommunications to train manufacturing, uh, a number of, of, of corruption-related issues. Uh, and once again, not long ago, that was widely accepted and, and, and even encouraged. Oh, but then we have uh, the issue of applicable law. Uh, most of the European countries, they didn't have uh, some sort of law like the U.S. Uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or the British uh, U.K. Bribery Act. But even those jurisdictions, uh, which my initial research has shown, uh, it was more politics uh, than legal implementation of uh, uh, recourses. So where are we? Where are we going to? Uh, will there be a fixed uh, line to be drawn? So far, I cannot tell you, but we will be sharing uh, those conclusions, hopefully by the end of this year. So once again, if you guys have any questions, I just overstepped two minutes. So, see, uh, you guys have uh, those uh, slides. Just feel free to ask. You have somewhere here you should yeah you have my email if you want to uh, share some material and uh, I'll be around so oh one other curiosity I mean I was really eager I, I just spent a week in, in Shanghai and, and a week in, in Hong Kong I wanted to talk to a lot of people about uh, corruption they don't talk at all I mean like they acknowledge the existence I'm, I'm talking about Chinese, of course. I mean, everyone else talks about it, but the Chinese, which, I mean, they should be proud as we Brazilians are. I mean, we're very good at that. So, they don't. Questions? Even if, if for the moot case, I mean, mostly for the moot case, but I, I, I got excited. Is this on? Yeah. Um, I am an, a student of the IDR LLM over at uh, Berlin, and I'm also a Mexican, a Mexican license, so I'm in the club. We're in the club. <laughs> um, during our, one of our classes, we were given a case. It was, uh, it was, we were told it was based on a real case, but we weren't told the, the you know, the real, the real data. But. The case was, we, we were told to put ourselves in the shoes of the arbitrator, of uh, tribunal, or the, 
right? I think it was a sole arbitrator. And my classmates are going to hate me because I brought this up, this issue, over and over again. Um, we were told to, that, that uh, the underlying case involved a series of contractors that had an agreement to take turns winning bids. Cartel. Right, exactly. Uh, it, was, it was basically a bid rigging agreement. Um, and uh, we were, uh, it involved the issue, um, I, I believe that it was posted to us uh, to, uh, to see more the um, antitrust issues. But I, since the beneficiary of the construction was uh, uh, the German government in, in that case, um, I also saw, you know, being Mexican, being so close to the United States, I saw... And far from God. And, and so far from God, um, I thought... This is very close to corruption. I mean, it is. There's a there's an issue involving bid rigging, antitrust, um, but it also there has to be some uh, corruption issues because it was a construction a, a, a construction cartel. Um, I I said as an arbitrator I wouldn't touch that with a ten foot pole given the DOJ um, uh, task uh, task force. Um, because in giving a, a solution, um, you would be part of a, a, a potential crime, and therefore you'd be an accessory. So I would not only would I deny jurisdiction, I would kind of say, "Please never contact me again." What would you do? Or what, am I being paranoid, like my classmates tell me? You see. Probably, I mean, he's changing his ethics. No, that's where I draw the line. Mm. I, I, I wouldn't go ahead and, uh, of course, I mean, this is the kind of case, we had a similar case, but the awarding party, he has assigned his contractual duties to a third party, bona fide third party. Then I would draw the line, I mean, knowingly or not knowingly, uh, we go back to the public interest. I mean, it was public works, which seems to be your case. But if if they rig the contest, uh, they I, uh, that's where I draw the line. They wouldn't have the protection of the applicable law, uh, be it public or private. Uh, and and uh, of course, I mean, I, I forgot to mention. I mean, Mexico is also. We have. Pemex, which is Mexican Petrobras, I mean, they've, they've gone way beyond. I mean, the famous Pemex case, they changed the law after an award was issued and for, for the execution, to the performance of, of, of the award. I mean, not even Brazil had done that. <laughs> Kudos. Uh, but that, that I, I, I agree with you. I, I, and we, ha we have had... If you want to research, we have hundreds of cases of cartel and arbitration in Brazil. You probably have it in Mexico, too. Yeah. <laughs> no more questions? Yeah. So, that's fine. Thank you, Claudio. Yeah, uh, <laughs> before I hand over for the closing remarks to uh, my colleague, Frau Umbeck, who is organizing the um, jointly with Luisa, the uh, Hansa Kamsi CVC pre -mood. I would just like to thank you all for coming here, for participating in that event. And in particular, I would like to thank my assistants, uh, Tilo Kerkhoff and Luna Matoso, a Brazilian as well, who did all the work here. Thank you very much. In addition, that all would also not have been possible without the excellent work of our IT computer team doing and organizing also the drivers. Thank you very much for your today as well. And uh, we are looking forward to the next event with you. And now I hand over to Elke. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. 
Good evening, good afternoon, uh, esteemed speakers, uh, dear colleagues and friends, dear Mutis. My closing remarks are actually opening remarks because tomorrow, finally, we have the camps we see pre moot again. Finally, again in person. We are so lucky to have you all here in person. You wouldn't believe. After two online editions, it's so good to have you here. So when we set up the Hamburg pre moot we had several missions in mind. First of all, to support the WIS moot in its aim to promote the CSG and the knowledge about arbitration law and you as participant, participating teams. Then, secondly, we like to connect and we like cultural exchange, and that is what the WISMUT is all about. So I'm happy that this evening we will have plenty of uh, opportunities, and even tomorrow, to mingle and connect and get to know each other. That's uh, really what I'm looking for. And thirdly, uh, we also wanted to show you and make you familiar with Hamburg as a place of arbitration. Hamburg is indeed an ideal place of arbitration. It has a long, long history, which relates back to the Hanseatic League. And it has um, several, probably due to the harbor where it's situated, uh, here located several arbitration institutions, some of them related to commodities, coffee, grain, all the stuff which comes uh, to the harbor. We have the, an institution at the uh, Chamber of Commerce here in Hamburg. We also have some uh, arbitration institution with focus on certain regional aspects like the Latin American uh, uh, Hamburg uh, Association and uh, Latin American Europe Asso uh, uh, Arbitration Association and the um, Chinese European Arbitration uh, Center here in Hamburg. And last but not least, we have a lot of very qualified arbitration practitioners here in the town. And that leads me to the very special uh, speciality of the Hamburg Premoot. The Hamburg Premoot is actually located in 19 Hamburg law firms, and that makes it really special. It's not in one seat at one university, would, would, uh, or, uh, that would also be a nice place, but uh, here we run the pre in different local law firms. And uh, the place is ideal for doing that because we are all relatively close by. So tomorrow, uh, the one who participates, uh, you have to go from one law firm to the other and get to know the arbitration practitioners where they actually work. So. I believe you have all received the latest schedule. There were some recent changes. <laughs> Unfortunately, one uh, team could not make it to, uh, to Hamburg, the Iranian team, and I felt really pity for them, I must say. They got no visa, and that is why they could not participate, neither in the, the Wismut nor uh, in the pre -mood. That is a real pity, but uh, I hope that they can make it then next year. Um, apart from that, we have this year 30, uh, one, uh, 31 teams. One other team has fallen ill. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we, we will sort that out. <laughs> um, yeah, 31 teams from 13 countries and 19 participating law firms. That is uh, a record for a non-online event, and uh, I'm grateful for all the participants. So I'm also grateful for all the help I got when organizing this uh, pre mood I'm actually only co-organizing it, because the main work really is really on the shoulders of the campus CBC, especially on Luisa's uh, shoulders. <laughs> and so thank you, Luisa, and thank you, Anna Flavia. You're doing a great job, and send my regards also to Carolina. Really, thank you so much for all your help and the thousands of emails you were writing. 
So uh, now I think we are heading off to our opening uh, reception that will be in one of the participating law firms in the office of Taylor Wessing with a wonderful view over the city. There are buses go, um, uh, departing here from the law school, I think uh, um, uh, now, basically. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, see you later at the reception and, for, uh, and tomorrow during the, the hearing and tomorrow evening at our law firm, which is Heuken uh, Kühnler Wojtex. Also, last thing, I send you uh, the regards uh, of the bo new board elected of the Hamburg Arbitration Circle, which pro you will probably meet tomorrow in one of the hearings or in the reception tomorrow evening. So. Good success tomorrow and see you later.